At the request of the Broadcasting and Recording Service, members and visitors in the public gallery are requested to ensure that for the duration of the meeting, their mobile phones are turned off completely or switched to airplane, safe or flight mode, depending on their device. It is not sufficient just to put phones on silent, as this will maintain the level of interference with the broadcasting system. Before we begin, I would just like to record our decision on the EU scrutiny schedule ACOM 2018782 on the composition of the Committee of the Regions. I propose that this proposal doesn't warrant any further scrutiny. Is that agreed? Thank you. The next item on the agenda is an engagement on affordable housing, and I would like to welcome to today's meeting from the Economic and Social Research Institution, Dr. Barra Rontree, Dr. Connor O'Toole, from the Housing Agency, Mr. John O'Connor, and Mr. Jim Bannon, and from O'Coolong Co-Housing Alliance, Mr. Hugh Brennan and Mr. John Moore. Just a note on privilege before we begin, I wish to draw your attention to the fact that by virtue of Section 17 one of the Defamation Act 2009, witnesses are protected by absolute privilege in respect of their evidence to this committee. <coughs> However, if you are directed by the committee to cease giving evidence in relation to a particular matter and you continue to do so, you are entitled thereafter on only to qualified privilege in respect of your evidence. You are directed that only evidence connected with the subject matter of these proceedings is to be given and you are asked to respect the parliamentary practice to the effect that where possible you should not criticise nor make charges against any person, person or identity by name or in such way to make him or her or it identifiable. Members are reminded of the long-standing parliamentary practice to the effect that they should not comment on, criticise or make charges against any person outside the House or an official either by name or in such way as to make him or her identifiable. I would now call Mr Brennan to make his opening statement. And uh, uh, committee members, first of all, thanks very much for the invitation to attend uh, this meeting on affordable housing. As you know, it's a, uh, an issue that's very close to our, our hearts. Just a little introduction first. O'Cool and Co-Housing Alliance, CLG, is a cooperative housing organisation with approved housing body status. We're a not-for-profit uh, company limited by guarantee and a registered charity. O'Cool is governed by a voluntary board of directors or trustees. Our motto is building communities, not just houses, and our mission is to try to provide cooperative, integrated homes at affordable prices in mixed income, sustainable communities with support from local authorities and other willing landowners, where owner members will live side by side with private and, uh, private and social tenant members, all sharing common amenities. What do we mean by fully integrated? A community comprised of mixed income, mixed age, mixed ethnicity, mixed mobility, mixed needs, you name it, all living together as neighbours. Cooperative, a venture or enterprise set up and run for the mutual benefit of its members, namely the residents of that particular um, development. And affordable, this is the important bit, a rent or mortgage which can be afforded by households which represent a maximum outlay of 32% of net income. And people argue between 30 and 35, but we say around 32 because you've all, you, you, know, you have to look at your housing needs and you may have, you know, you always have utilities to pay and if, you're, if you own the property you have, you're going to have some maintenance, if you're renting it's just uh, utilities. We are currently the only approved housing body in Ireland offering affordable homes for owner-occupiers and one of a very few intending to offer homes for affordable rent. And we will do this in collaboration with TUA Housing. We have a collaboration agreement with TUA Housing where TUA will manage both social houses and affordable rental in um, developments that we both work on. Our inaugural project in Poppin Tree, Ballymun, which has just been completed, comprises 49 well-designed and high-spec a2 rated, two bed, three bed and four bed homes with an average price for the three bedroom homes of around 170,000. And with all the benefits of living in a cooperative community, our initial project is heavily, heavily oversubscribed. And we currently have over 1,300 people on a waiting list for house in North Dublin. And for a small co-op, which we accept we are, I think you'll agree that that's kind of crazy. Such is the interest in and the demand for social housing that O'Coolan model has garnered widespread attention from prospective purchasers, local authorities, funders, philanthropic organisations, political parties, elected representatives, government ministers, academics and media commentators. To date we have attracted over 200,000 in philanthropic funding to help us build our own capacity so that we can replicate and scale the model. And we are in line to receive additional philanthropic funding over the next three years to continue scaling uh, this process in line with our strategic plan. 
AIB has also committed to funding our schemes. They have referenced O'Coolan, the O'Coolan model in public utterances, including in their regular housing reports and at various Doyle committees. We have also raised 1.5 million in short-term finance through loan notes. This is fairly innovative. Private individuals, companies and a charitable trust are now investing in O'Coolan because they want to see their money used to create social impact in Ireland and get a reasonable return. And loan note holders have, accept, have chosen to accept varying rates of return from between 0.5% and 4% for periods of 18 months or three years. Our model is de-risked because O'Coolan pre-sells all units on a phase-by-phase -phase basis before uh, construction ever uh, commences. Um, we use a design-build contract with a strict no variation or maximum fixed price clause, so there are no nasty surprises for us at the end of the contract or during the contract. The contractor effectively buys out the risk of any variation in our pre-contract negotiations. The process of building community, really important to us, starts as soon as we're given to go ahead for a scheme and is carried out during the Section 183 process. We hold several meetings and a common charter is prepared by the residents before they move in. We're going to start a second development to Ballymun in two weeks' time and the selling price there of an average three-bedroom house will be in the region of 219. You might say we had one um, scheme at 170 and now the next one is 219. Why the difference? The difference is there is some inflation but also there's higher development costs for us in the second scheme. There's about 5,000 cubic metres of um, muck away as we say or soil to be removed and that, that, adds, that, that includes the price. But still 219 um, is affordable according to the criteria we mentioned earlier. We agree eligibility criteria with local authorities. Houses are allocated on a first come, first serve basis according as applicants meet the eligibility criteria and uh, by appointing an allocation committee where the demand exceeds supply at the end of the process which always happens. Our ideal mix will be for 60% owner occupiers, 20% social rental and 20% affordable rental but this has to be in agreement with local authorities who ultimately determine the mix. So that's just our own preference. In terms of obstacles, what are our obstacles in, in replicating the, 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 the model? It's land. Land, land, land. If land is available in the AHB sector, we can do the rest. We can provide the uh, private finance and we can go ahead and build the um, sustainable communities. We would ask the government take a broad view when looking to set value in the disposal of land. 95% of our members will never buy on the open market. And yet when they do buy from us, 50,000 euros from each sale, approximately, goes back to the exchequer in terms of that and, and other taxes. That, if you like, is a windfall gain for, for, for the Exchequer. And as well as that, 60% of our members have been renting at an average rent of 1,500 per month, um, but their mortgages are only an average of 850 a month. This leaves discretionary disposable income available for spending in the local area. There are 2,000 plots available in Ballymun. If all of those were used for the affordable model, that would increase the income in Ballymun alone by 13 million per year. If any economists to uh, uh, check this and, and uh, approve it for us. Um, that, that is huge for an area like Ballymun and uh, could provide the additional services that we need in Ballymun to get the shopping centre up and going again. Um, I'm, go I, I'm going to leave it at, at that um, because it, 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 I'll probably go on for a, a bit long. But just to say that in this, there is also a table at the back of it which shows, uh, just for, for the members, the, the gross income, the net income, the max affordable mortgage or rent that you should be paying at 30% of your net income, well, mortgage at 30% and rent at 32%, and then the various houses that you can afford um, earning at, the, at those limits. If you are earning around 45,000, it is very difficult to get a house, but you can still get one in one of our schemes with the Rebuilding Ireland loan and, and also with the Help to Buy scheme. We, we're trying to argue for, if you can get your heads around it, is kind of a variable subsidy. That if, that, that if you're only, only earning 45,000, you will need a full subsidy. If you're earning 75 or 80, or we would argue to extend the, the limits up to 90, that you need a much lesser subsidy. And, and the difference in the two can actually go back to the local authorities to pay for land, because that's one of the big issues that we get. Sorry, thanks. Thank you, uh, Chair. I now call on Mr. O'Connor to make the opening statement. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair. Uh, uh, Chair, mem members, uh, we are pleased to be here this morning to assist the committee in its, in its examination of the issues facing us in relation to affordable housing. I'm accompanied by my colleague uh, Jim Bainham, uh, Head of Housing Delivery. Uh, the agency's vision is to promote the building of sustainable communities. Uh, critical to this is that everyone is able to live in good quality and affordable housing. Uh, affordability. 
The overall aim for our society is to have housing available that is affordable for households across a wide range of income groups. Uh, housing for purchase uh, and for rental are the main elements of this. Uh, as a general rule, housing costs should be below one third of a household income. Uh, for lower income uh, groups, this needs to be lower, lower again. Uh, there are households on very low incomes that require social housing or housing support to ensure their housing costs are affordable. There are other households that have sufficient income and finance to purchase or rent. Uh, then there is a group on low, medium, moderate incomes that may need some assistance uh, to purchase or rent. Uh, so it is this group uh, that I'll focus on. Uh, we'll focus on two areas in particular, uh, affordable purchase housing uh, and uh, cost rental housing. Um, on affordability and access, um, the first approach is to take measures to keep down the cost of housing uh, to rent or buy. Uh, the, the basic elements of this are keeping down construction, land and finance costs. Uh, a number of measures have been uh, taken in recent years, for example, uh, improving the planning system, intro introducing the vacant site levy, direct funding for infrastructure, rental controls and the introduction of rent pressure zones, and the making of development finance available. Um, affordable purchase. Uh, the main focus of the state over many decades has been on measures to assist home ownership. Uh, this includes various home loan provisions, mainly through local authorities, first-time buyers' grants, tax relief on loan interest, affordable housing, shared ownership and low-cost site schemes. Uh, currently, there are three particular measures in place. The Help to Buy scheme that effectively provides a grant by way of tax rebate of up to 5% of the pur pur purchase price of new homes costing up to €500,000. The maximum payment uh, is €20,000 per property. Uh, the Re Rebuilding Ireland Home Loan that provides low cost fixed and variable interest rate home loans for certain income groups uh, and the Tenant Purchase Scheme for local authority social housing tenants. A new affordable purchase scheme is being commenced. Uh, this follows the commencement of Part 5 of the Housing Miscellaneous Provisions Act 2009. Under this scheme, local authorities can provide affordable housing. The aim is to use local authority and state lands uh, and or infrastructure funding to provide affordable housing. Uh, most importantly, the discount from market value is retained uh, by the local authority uh, as equity in the property. Uh, when this equity is repaid, the local authority can recycle this to provide more affordable housing. Um, coupled with it, under the, the site, Service Sites Fund, uh, 350 million has been provided to pay for infrastructure to help local authorities uh, deliver uh, affordable housing for purchase or rent. Um, cost rental uh, is something I particularly want to uh, highlight. The focus for affordable housing has been on home ownership. Uh, a key element of achieving uh, affordable housing in many countries is the development of a cost rental sector that over time provides a significant amount of housing that is affordable to a wide range of households. The Housing Agency is currently supporting the Department of Housing Planning and Local Government in the development of a cost rental or not profit rental model. This form of rental is common in other European countries such as the Netherlands, Austria and Denmark. Uh, some points to note on cost rental are the main elements for cost rental to achieve affordability over time are the use of low cost land, long term low cost finance and funding and the non profit approach. Thinking long, long term, 50 years plus is key to making this work. Uh, it is more it is a more sustainable a a model where assets and future rental inflows can be used to leverage further investment building a low-cost rental sector. There are currently two pilot projects being progressed uh, in Dunleary on the Enniscary Road and in Dublin City uh, at St Michael's Estate in Chicor. The department is being supported by the European Investment Bank to leverage its international expertise and its advisory and research capacity in the development of an appropriate cost rental uh, model. Uh, Chair, there is a lot more information we can provide on affordable housing. We are happy to answer any questions which members may have 
or to provide further details as required. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. O'Connor. Now I now call on Dr. O'Toole for the opening statement. Uh, let me begin by thanking the Chair for the invitation uh, to the SRI to appear before the Committee. Uh, I'm Dr. Uh, Conor O'Toole and I'm joined by my uh, colleague Dr. Barra Roundtree. We're delighted to have the opportunity to share with the Committee uh, the findings of our empirical research in the area of housing affordability. In our evidence today, we will focus on the findings of two recent studies on the Irish housing market. Uh, firstly, an exploration of trends in housing affordability and secondly, an assessment of how a housing assistant payment, or HAP, works, uh, affects work incentives. Both of these studies are publicly available on the ESRI website. At the outset, I would like to acknowledge uh, the study on affordability has been conducted in conjunction with economists at the Department of Housing, Planning and Local Government under the ongoing research collaboration on housing economics between the ESRI and the Department. This initiative is an excellent opportunity to link research evidence and policy across the range of housing topics considered. So last June, uh, the SRI and the Department released our research paper on trends in housing affordability in Ireland. Using detailed household data from the CSO Survey of Income and Living Conditions, the objectives of this research were threefold. First, to document the housing affordability trends across Irish households split by age, region, household structure and their position in the income distribution. Second, to look at international definitions of high, high housing cost and evaluate the suitability of these thresholds in an Irish context. Third, to provide evidence to inform policy in terms of the targeting specific groups with affordability challenges. All this research is built on measuring housing affordability in terms of the share of net monthly household incomes that are spent on the housing payment, be it rent uh, or a mortgage. A number of clear findings emerged from the research. On average, households were paying approximately one-fifth of their income on housing costs in 2016, and that was only a very slight increase from 2005. However, for specific subgroups, significant affordability challenges are evident. In particular, households in the private rental sector, those living in urban centres, particularly Dublin, and those on low incomes face the greatest challenges. Indeed, households in the, in the lowest 25% of the income distribution were paying nearly two-fifths of their income on housing payments. This does not include the cost of other housing services or utilities. Looking at mortgage holders in more detail, we found a sharp increase in housing repayment burdens for low-income mortgaged households between 2008 and 2015. Many of these households received relatively high levels of mortgage credit with poor underwriting during the boom, and this reinforces the importance of strong macroprudential rules on credit access for potential borrowers. We find that over the period 2005 to 2016, low-income renters have consistently faced high housing cost to income ratios. While rental price inflation has been high in the very recent period, the persistent high rent to income ratios suggest affordability challenges are structural rather than cyclical in nature in that market, i.e. they have persisted over time. Using simple thresholds, such as the share of households spending over 30% of their income on high housing costs, would indicate about one in six households had high housing costs by this metric. But this figure was one in three for private renters and seven in ten for households in the lowest quarter of the income distribution. Finally, the paper explored how much income households had left after they made their housing uh, payment, the so-called residual income approach and tested whether this will be sufficient to purchase a minimum standard of living in terms of goods and services. We find many low and middle income households would have insufficient resources after, households, as after housing costs to do so. We also find that many low income households, even if their housing cost is low, they have few resources left after making their monthly rent or mortgage payment. The policy implications of this research are twofold. First, the pockets of high housing costs identified suggest that an increase in the long-term provision of state-supported housing and the development of alternative rental models which limit cost pressures are required to provide low-income households with sufficient financial buffers to withstand both economic shocks and market fluctuations. The, the research suggests that there will be considerable benefit from a policy perspective in adopting an affordable housing definition based on international norms that could be used in both monitoring and as an evidence-based anchor in terms of the eligibility for various schemes. 
For example, eligibility for social housing, which is also based on strict income limits, could also be linked to a common evidence-based definition of high housing cost. However, this research did not consider any specific scheme in detail. I'm now going to pass you to my colleague, uh, Barra Rowntree, to talk through our research on the housing assistance yeah. payment. Thanks very much, Barra. Um, so one specific policy which we've recently conducted research on at the SRI is um, the newly, newly brought in housing assistance payment, or HAP, which the government plans will eventually replace the rental accommodation scheme, RAS, and rent supplement for long-term claimants. These three payments in 2016 covered around a quarter of the private rental market, uh, with this proportion likely to grow in the coming years if the government's targets set out in rebuilding Ireland are met. Um, so the new research as part of the ISRI's tax welfare and pensions programme finds that in addition to uh, providing support for low-income families for housing costs, HAP should improve the financial work incentives for most households who would otherwise claim uh, rent supplement. Um, this is primarily because HAP does not require claimants to work less than 30 hours per week to remain eligible for the payment. Uh, as does rent supplement, and is means tested against other income at a slower rate than rent supplement is. So these differences will also result in more working households qualifying for HAP than would have for rent supplement. However, our research looked at the impact of introducing HAP under, with tenants' rent contributions assessed through a unified national differential rent scheme that was being considered by the uh, Department of Housing in 2014, proposed by the Housing Agency. Uh, under the version of HAP that's actually been rolled out nationally, Tenants' rental contributions are instead determined by their county or city council's differential rent schemes, uh, also used to calculate the contributions of local authority tenants. Uh, while like the, that unified uh, national differential rent scheme that we considered, these uh, local authority differential rent schemes place no restrictions on working more than 30 hours per week and so should strengthen the financial work incentives um, HAP claimants face relative to rent supplement. The detail of these schemes differs significantly and means that um, the level of support provided by HAP to claimants with identical circumstances can vary substantially across local authorities. To give you an example uh, that should kind of fix this, if you consider a, a one earner couple with two children and earnings before tax around of 35,000 per year, who find a two-bedroom property to rent for 1275 a month, that's the maximum allowed before flexibility under HAP or rent supplement limits. Um, if they find that in the area covered by South Dublin County Council, they'll pay about €270 Euro per month in rent. If they find that instead, you know, with the exact same circumstances in Dublin City Council, they'll pay about 350 a month. And if they find that in Bray or Greystones, that'll be 450 a month that they'll pay in rent. Um, it's very difficult to justify differences in level of support for a national scheme when they arise not because of differences in the quality of accommodation or because of the desirability of those areas, you know, the market rent for these properties is the same in all cases, uh, but because essentially the historic choices made by local authorities and HAP using local authority schemes to, to determine rents. Um, the anticipated growth of HAP means that the issue surrounding the design of differential rent schemes is likely to be of increasing importance both for central and local policymakers. Key among these as well are the limits on rents that can be paid for a property by someone receiving HAP or rent supplement, uh, which were last revised in March 2017. Uh, since then, the rental index compiled by the ESRI for the Residential Tenancies Board, RTB, suggests average rents have risen by 13% and even more in Dublin. Uh, reducing the proportion, number of properties available for rent under either of the scheme. Given the rate of rental inflation, there's a clear need for more regular review of these limits, analogous to the typically annual increases made to the maximum well, uh, rates of payment for social welfare benefits, typically in the budget each year brought in by the, the, the Social Welfare Act. However, it is important for policymakers to be aware of the potential impacts these rental limits can have on the wider rental market. But international evidence on the ultimate economic incidence of rental subsidies is mixed. So, for example, a recent study suggested 90% of the burden of cuts to the UK's main income-related support for rental costs, housing benefit, in 2011, fell on tenants. But an earlier study of earlier cuts to uh, that same benefit suggested that was closer to a third. So the evidence isn't particularly strong about actually where the incidence of rental subsidies falls. Uh, but it is important to consider that there may be knock-on implications. So to conclude, uh, the evidence clearly indicates an increased requirement for social and supported housing in Ireland in the coming years. In this context, long-term investment in and expansion of public housing stock for rent is key. Policies to provide low-cost rental options for households, such as cost rental or housing cooperatives, can form uh, part of that new rental landscape. Other policies, such as rental uh, price controls or subsidies, can be effective, at least in the short term, in providing alleviation of price pressures. However, such responses may have limitations, particularly in the longer run, or possible unintended consequences. But crucially, understanding the structural rather than cyclical nature of persistent affordability challenges for many low-income households and urban renters is critical to deciphering the appropriate policy response. 
The research suggests uh, state intervention is required to provide appropriately priced accommodation for these households through the economic cycle. As our economy tends to navigate the many uncertainties ahead, such as Brexit or a potential global economic slowdown, it's important that we ensure a steady provision of such units regardless. Thanks very much, Chairman. No, I'll take questions from the floor. I just want to know that uh, most members want to engage in this topic, so uh, I'll take two members at a time if they could restrict themselves to five minutes each. I'll start with Victor. Okay, first I want to just throw out the general questions to, to anyone who wants to answer them. I think clearly, again, we already know what I think everyone in this room, um, but you re reinforce that, the evidence of the need for state intervention with, with social and affordable houses. And we need a massive increase in the output of social and affordable housing. Um, the issue of land, land and land, I think you made that yourself, Mr Brennan, is, is critical. So I'd like to hear what, what are your relationships with the local authorities. I, I live myself in Dunleary Rathdown. I'm familiar with a place like Carrick Mine, Shangana Castle. Vast potential for five, six, seven hundred homes still sitting there, sold by the Department of Justice many, many, many years ago. So can you just share with us uh, your experiences with the local authorities in terms of access to land? Because I've heard from other cooperative movements and people involved and smaller charities who have approached local authorities. They've met with a blank door. A door said, no, not interested. We're going to do it ourselves at some stage. But they haven't done it. And, uh, I mean, I'm very familiar with uh, Okul on the model. It's a really successful one. I, I mean, I, I think it really is a success, and I think you sell it well as well. And I've been out to see some of your units, and I'm very, very impressed, but also keenly in, impressed by the keen pricing of these units and also that idea of that affordable, cooperative, inclusive model that has a percentage of social and affordable rent to rent and to purchase. And I think that's really, really important. So you might just share with us your experience with the local authorities, also with other state agencies. I am constantly talking about you know, the need for big state agencies to have massive land banks. We know there's a national inventory of state lands being undertaken. It's still a long way away. But you might just share with your experience in relation to that. And then one or two things. I think this differential, which you put, put your hand on it, Mr. Rowntree, there was, this differential scheme. And you will be aware that the government were trying to introduce a national differential scheme. So maybe you might tease out that. You mentioned about the differential rent scheme here. And you say the anticipated growth of HAP means that issues surrounding the design of differential <coughs> schemes are likely to be of increased importance both centrally and to local policymakers. So I'd like to hear, maybe you might just tease out a bit more on that, and also your comment on this sort of national sort of scheme, you know, differential scheme and, and the pitfalls in and around that as you, as, you, as you may see them. And then finally, just again to say that you, look, we all know that low income earners, say, the problem is with a lot of low income earners, there's a threshold for social housing, so they're caught, these people are caught between not being eligible for social housing, uh, the ones that get up early in the morning, uh, and if they have a job and looking to have a job work, but the reality is they're in low incomes, so they're trapped. They're just above the threshold for social housing. They cannot access funding uh, for, um, to, to purchase or to rent, and they're, they're being squeezed out, and people are now moving from the cities out. And one other thing, I'm really interested in this synergy between the private sector, i.e. the private banking sector, and Mr. Brennan, you again talked about building a relationship with the AIB, or AIB wanting to build a relationship with you, and we hear a lot of negatives about the banks, but I'm interested to hear how that relationship is going and how, how, what, where's the role for private finance and the synergies between the private sector in all of this? Uh, because that's something that has to be explored. And I know people may have ideological reasons to oppose it, but look, the bottom line is we have a major housing crisis in terms of affordability. So I'm really interested in anyone here today telling me of their experiences in terms of the synergies and possibilities with the private sector, both in construction and the private sector in relation to finance. Thank you. Owen. Thanks very much, Chair, and thanks for all of the presentations. Um, I suppose an opening comment and then questions for, for each of the three presenters. Um, this is probably one of the most important issues that this committee is going to consider this year. Alongside meeting social housing need, uh, uh, affordability is just an issue of enormous importance. Uh, and we're going to be doing a number of these sessions and ultimately report with recommendations to, to, to the Minister and, and to the Oireachtas. Um, uh, so I welcome all of the, the contributions. There was a really interesting conference that a number of us was, were at, including John, yesterday organised by the Raise the Roof campaign. And there was a broad consensus, both from the floor and from a lot of the speakers there, that we need a fundamental shift in our housing policy. Uh, and that we, what we need to see is 
far greater levels of investment in a kind of a new model of public housing that meets both subsidised social housing needs, but also uh, what I call non-subsidised affordable rental and affordable purchase need uh, on a scale to meet the kind of demand that's out there. And I think in that context, the ESRI paper is incredibly important because while we all know anecdotally that the affordability pressures in our constituencies, it's the first piece of research I've seen that tries to actually kind of quantify how many people are we talking about? What's the kind of scale of the affordability uh, crisis that's out there? Um, uh, and I think that's one of the issues the committee does need to look at in terms of uh, the report itself. My questions are as follows. Hugh, um, one of the big question marks over, over not only your own organisation but your sector is you know, if the government was of a mind to spend an awful lot more money on, on uh, your model of, of affordable housing, what level of, of uh, capacity is there? Um, you know, uh, uh, and this isn't an argument against you delivering more units, but you know, can you talk us through what you think, first of all, is the capacity that's there? The second thing is the service size fund, obviously the increase in the fund and the equity stake that's now uh, uh, apportioned to it. That should mark some kind of change on, on uh, what you were doing before. So have you noticed, for example, the local authorities that are uh, in the first round of bids for that? Are they coming to you? Are they talking to you? Have you noticed any change? And what's your view of that equity stake element that's in the service sites fund? Does that complicate things more or, or not? The last one then is on the land. My preferred option, of course, is, is that the land isn't sold, that the land remains in public ownership. Uh, uh, and that, in a sense, then allows that unit to be in perpetuity in the affordable housing system. So that if the purchaser of one of your units at a future point wants to sell, they can't sell and make a windfall profit you know, from, from the, the rising value of the land that they have to sell back into the scheme. Can you talk us through your views of that? And, and did you at one stage look at the possibility of not actually allowing the tenants to sell the properties into the market, but back into affordability and what the obstacles were? Two quick sets of questions for the SRI, the housing agency. The research is really, really good. Um, uh, and, and the two points I suppose I'd like you to elaborate on in relation to the affordability. Lots of people think that the affordability crisis is something that's just happened since the crash in terms of the rental market. Can you just elaborate more on when you talk about structural rather than cyclical and maybe use plain English rather than uh, economic speak so, so we're all completely clear? Because if I understand it right, what it means is this problem has been around for a very, very long period of time. Um, and if, if we or the state wanted to quantify the numbers of households involved, how would we go about doing that? Because you know, there's kind of estimates in your own research, uh, but I'd be interested in it. Um, uh, uh, and that, and then, Hugh, can you give us more update on the pilots? Like Enniscary Road, we've been told, told as a pilot for, for over two years, and uh, I, I know you're frustrated, as we are, in how long it's taking. But also, can you talk us through the tension between the cost rental element of it and the affordable element of it? Because my understanding with Enniscary Road, it's going to be about 80% of market rent, which means the entry rents in Enniscary Road uh, in that pilot aren't going to be affordable for the target group that's required. And can you talk us through how you could have an affordable cost rental model, um, you know, in terms of, for example, how the capital advance loan facility could be used or soft loans by the state alongside uh, 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 other loans? Uh, and also on the issue of land, because obviously you guys have land and you are engaging with, you know, various people. I mean, would it be the housing agency's view that land should be held onto publicly and leased out? What kind of conditions should be put on it if it's disposed of? And particularly, I suppose, one of the issues some of us have a concern about is not something now, but at some distant point in the future, if public land is released, for example, to approved housing bodies, uh, and when all of their loans are paid back, they own that land. And while it might not be the view of the people running those approved housing bodies today to change the use of those properties, they might have different boards of directors with different business models in the future. And how can we protect the state's interest when we're putting very significant financial uh, investments into public housing? Uh, and is controlling the land element of it one way of ensuring that into perpetuity? Hang on, I'll start with you maybe and we'll work down there. Okay, thanks. So, um, so via yeah, Victor first, um, our dealings with local authorities, it varies, I have to say, around, around the country. Um, Dublin City Council, and maybe I shouldn't mention individual ones, but... but, yeah, but can I? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, well, 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 Dublin City Council has been, have been hugely supportive, so, um, but they recognise that our model works in um, Ballymun, and they've said directly to us that they would like to keep us in, 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 in Ballymun, and that's, and that's fine for, for Dublin City Council. Um, 
we, we, we're engaging now with, with, with Cork City Council, and there's some two very interesting schemes there. And um, I'll answer one of Owen's questions with this as well, just in terms of the service sites fund. So um, it's a scheme that was put out for public expressions of interest in Boher Boy. It's 80% affordable and 20% social. There's 147 um, units, I think. Um, and um, they're making full use of the service sites fund there, which is around 50,000 um, per site. Now, they want to recoup the value of that land at 2 million and um, they mention about charging de uh, development levies, although I'd say that that would probably be uh, up for, for negotiation. So when we do our figures on it, um, if we're paying the, the, two, the two million, we're adding around 13,000 per unit, okay? And if we're paying the development levies, it's probably around another 5,000 per unit. So that will push our, our selling price, if you like, from around 200 up to around 220,000. But then when you take back in the service sites, fund into it as well, um, that brings us back, back down a bit. So um, in that instance, it seems like that you know, one fund is being used to offset another, but that's okay because the aggregate is that we can still provide um, affordable housing um, in, in, in that area. In other local authorities, yes, there, you, you, know, you, you, you can get the, uh, the, the, the closed door. You see, you know, there is a protocol in place that, that, that when local authorities are dealing with approved housing bodies, they will um, identify a piece of land, they will put it out to a number of approved housing bodies depending on, on the use that they want for that land. Usually that is not for affordable housing, you know, um, Dublin City and Cork are exceptions, usually it is not for affordable housing. So in your own uh, constituency we identified a piece of land up at Mullen Still Road, you may know it, it's a big piece of land, it, I think it's three or four hectares, there was certainly room for around 400 units there and we, we made a proposal on that. Now, you know, they told us that um, that isn't serviced and they haven't put in an application for the site service fund there. However, on that one, because there's 400 houses in it and the services actually stop about 200 yards down the road, we would run the services in and spread that cost amongst the, the houses and still be able to deliver um, at an affordable rate. So what we're asking really from the local authorities is just more engagement with us, you know, to say that if there's a piece of land there and it can be used and we can help them to bring it in, that, then ab absolutely. That's, that's, what, that's what we would like uh, from the local authorities. Other local authorities around the country have absolutely been in contact with us. We were talking to Galway recently. They have a scheme in Ballinasloe, but Ballinasloe is interesting in that probably all houses in Ballinasloe being built on the open market are affordable um, anyway. Now, they want a mixed tenure um, uh, project down there and we're more than happy to talk to them, provided that we know that we can pre-sell because that's important to us, important to our, to our model, so, so that we can attract the funding. Um, in terms of other land banks, um, we, we're arguing for a while now that the IDA needs to be making some of their land available for affordable housing. Why? They're attracting uh, uh, big companies into the country, and where are those people going to live? And wouldn't that be a huge incentive to companies coming in if they knew that there was land available for affordable housing in their area? Now, there's a, an IDA park in Bray, and I've, I've mentioned this before, and there's a couple of big companies in there. They've approached us to say that their employees can't rent or buy in the area. And they're going out as far as Kilcock and Maynooth, etc. And it's taking them whatever amount of time to travel out, out, out to Bray. Um, and they know they're going to lose those employees. There is IDA land available, eight kilometres away, in, in Greystones. 30, how many, many acres? 30-odd 30, 30 30 acres of it. Now, we don't want 30 acres. We'll take 12 acres. <laughs> and, we'll, and we'll build... Yeah, Pat, no, yeah, he knows this. I'm <laughs> and well we, aware of and we, and we will And we will build 200 top-quality houses there for, 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 uh, for, for people in the area. So how about a policy change with IDA? Let's make 20% of IDA land available where it's suitable, not, not everywhere, where it's suitable for, for affordable housing. In terms of our finance arrangements and relationship with the bank, yes, I have to say that AIB did come on board at the start and they have um, been very supportive of what we are doing. We told them that we're getting um, this um, interest now in loan notes where others want to invest uh, in us and um, that's at a maximum of 4% and those investors actually, they're, they're, they, they range from a half a percent to 4% because some of them, they just want their money to be used for social impact as they say. And in fairness to AIB, they brought down their interest rates to us by a full percent to, uh, 
to, um, to keep us on board. So we're, we're happy to work with AIB, but also with our, with our, um, our private loan, loan note holders. Um, and then, um, Owen, in terms of um, the capacity and the, 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 our, our ability to scale, we effectively are developers, all right? Um, bad word, but we're social developers, or as that Nun and Ballymun calls us soft developers. And so are the, uh, so is the AHB, or so are other AHBs in the sector. And we've spoken to the other AHBs. As you know, all of the other housing associations at the moment, with the exception of the, 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 the one in, in, um, in Enniskerry Road, focus entirely on social housing. Now, they have the capacity to do what we're doing, and they have the money, which is, which is great as well. I mean, they have the balance sheet, we don't, um, to, to invest in affordable housing if the land is made available. And we're talking to them, and we're also talking, or will be talking to the um, Irish Council for Social Housing to see if that kind of, you know, remit can be included in their works. Because as far as we're concerned, Practically all housing is social housing. I mean, everything, you know, that's where we start our socialization as, uh, you know, as, as, as human beings is, is in, in our home. But we say the only house that isn't a, so a social house is the big gated mansion, and that's anti-social housing, but we won't, we won't, go, we won't go there. <laughs> um, I mentioned the service sites fund. The, um, the equity stake, that's an interesting one. Um, our preference, I think, as I said before, is that we would like that if anybody sells the house, that they have to sell it back to us, okay? And then that we can sell it on again, and it remains affordable in perpetuity that way. We had difficulty with financing there, not for the construction finance, but for getting the, the individual getting the mortgage. The bank will say that there is a restriction on the sale of the house, and if that person gets into serious arrears, that the money that they would get for, from us for the house might not match those arrears. Now, we have said, that, in effect, would be a charging order on the folio. We have said that we're more than happy to postpone that charge in favour of the bank. So the bank always has first charge, and if they need to repossess, and if somebody's in serious arrears and they need to get the money back, they can get that through sale on the open market. We don't mind that. But in the general run of things, we would love that people would sell back to us. And eventually, we think we will get there. And if we, and, and if, and if we do get more um, uh, private finance support, it might actually give us the independence to be able to you know, work something in there as well. Um, that's the clawback, the equity stake. Yeah, so the local authorities e equity stake, I don't really have, you know, um, a, a, a huge um, objection to it. Um, I'd, I'd, I'd nearly prefer um, our own method if we can keep doing our, our own method. Um, but I know that there are different regulations coming down on that, you know. And, and we would also ac actually argue that the upper income limits that should be raised, especially in the Dublin area. I don't think 75 is... Um, is, is sufficient for that. I think I've covered it all. Yeah. Uh, John or Jim? Yeah, John? I, I, I'll, um, thank you very much, uh, uh, Ch Chair. Um, so, so Senator Boylan, you know, the first thing, yeah, in terms of, of a state intervention, you know, in terms of social housing and cost rental housing, yes, uh, um, you know, uh, we need to do a huge amount uh, more, no, no question about that. Uh, very specifically in relation to O'Coolon, the housing agency have uh, various sites around, around the country. Uh, we will be make, making a number available. We haven't told O'Coolon yet to, to O'Coolon, uh, which are, they're working uh, uh, in conjunction with um, uh, to, to a housing association. But no, we make, we will be making uh, a number of sites avail, available. Uh, that, that, that. You're all witnesses. By <laughs> this is a site for sore eyes. <laughs> Um, the different, differential, rent, differential rent scheme, having a, a national differential rent sc uh, scheme, uh, there is <coughs> provision in what's called the Housing Miscellaneous Provisions Act of 2009 uh, to have uh, a national scheme, national framework uh, for rents. The department have been uh, working on that and it, it, it is critical to bring in uh, a national fr framework, you know, to have consistency across the country. Um, Bringing it in politically is, a, is an issue because there's, from tenants' perspective, there are some winners and losers, and from local authorities' point of view in terms of income, there's winners and, and, and losers. But we do need to start um, bringing it in and bring it, tra transitioning it in over a period. I think. The chair, just might just tease out yeah. the winners and losers. Yeah, yeah, if you don't mind, Victor, yeah. everybody wants to get in yeah. today. Yeah. Now I'll We're go to a second round of points, hand, so if you wouldn't mind. Just but, but very briefly, the, on, just on the winners and uh, losers, in, in terms of if you, if you brought in a consistent rents, you know, different rent across the country, 
Some tenants, uh, their rent would increase and some tenants, their rent would decrease. So, for example, in South Dublin County Council, their rent would increase. Wexford County Council, their rent would decrease, just in you know, terms of two examples for, for tenants. And then from local authorities, um, South Dublin County Council's rent income, from, uh, income uh, would increase and Wexford County Council's income would decrease, you know, as a result. So both from the tenants' perspective and from a point of view, there is um, effects of, of doing that. But it is needed. It's very important. In terms of, of um, our dealings with, with the banks, uh, and we've dealt with, with all, the, all the banks, um, they, and they have been helpful. W one bank, and, you know, I'll compliment them in terms of AIB. We have a huge amount of engagement uh, with AIB, uh, and they have been supportive in terms of what you know has been do has been done you know particularly in relation to uh, provision of, of, of housing um, in terms of, of deputy O'Brien uh, on you know a number of questions you've asked um, firstly yeah public housing and building up a public housing you know sector both social rental but also uh, affordable rental or cost rental is is critical we need to build that up on, on, a, on a big scale if we're to assist uh, uh, households throughout the country. There, there are a lot of households that um, will not be able to you know, afford to buy, but we need to provide, provide them with um, affordable rental accommodation uh, and secure rental accommodation uh, uh, long term. The um, site services uh, funds you know, and the question of land own ownership, um, the, where there is state lands yeah, the ideal would be that there is long-term control uh, on that land because the danger is uh, we develop that land uh, and it's lost to the state. Uh, from the housing agency's uh, perspective, where we are transferring lands, we have been, as far as possible, putting in controls. You know, in terms of um, the, in terms of it being retained for social housing or, in some cases, cost rental uh, housing. Um, it can be done in two ways. Uh, one is having conditions in the title as covenants in, in the title. Um, much stronger is where you provide a lease, a long-term lease, uh, and you have a lot of contro controls uh, in, in, in that case. Um, and I think that it is something that we need to tease out, you know, in terms of how the state uh, retains long-term control. It's, it's easy in relation to rental housing, uh, when you get into home ownership because of the common law system and because of our legislation uh, and, the, and the rights in terms of freehold, uh, that's, that is more difficult. When, when you have home ownership, uh, you, you, it's, it's more difficult to have uh, a lease uh, in, 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 in place. Um, but it, it is something that if we are to utilise state lands uh, on, on a large scale over the next number of years, we need to think very carefully about uh, how we retain appropriate control from the state's point of view uh, and that's what you know a number of countries do you know very specifically take one example in the Netherlands uh, the state effectively never sells the land you know they have various forms of, of leases but it's backed up by by huge legislative system uh, that 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 backs that up but um, yeah controls uh, are very important uh, and from the housing agency's point of view uh, we have been trying to put those controls uh, in, 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 in place, um, in some cases with an amount of resistance, but we've been uh, putting those, uh, we get lots of solicitors in uh, trying to <laughs> convince us otherwise, um, but we, we have been putting those in, in place. Um, just specifically on the Enniscary Road and some uh, details, and I'll ask my colleague, you know, I'll, I'll give some details, Jim, Jim maybe will uh, elaborate. So on the Enniscary Road, this is a site uh, in Dunleer Rat Downs uh, area. There's to be 155 uh, apartments and houses provided on, on that site. Um, 105 of those are for social housing. Uh, 50 are uh, for cost rental. Uh, and uh, we've been uh, very interested in, in getting cost rental uh, operating. Uh, the site has been provided at, at no cost to a combination of two housing associations, two housing associations, and, and respond. Uh, and Dunleary, right down, and council have been very uh, in, involved in it. Um, at this point, 
it's ready to commence on site. You know, tenders have been submitted. It's a question of just an instruction to the contractor uh, to commence. Um, we do want to get the, the, the rents on the, the cost rental side down as low as possible. Um, so, uh, say the site has been provided at no cost. Um, we've been looking at how the funding of that site and, and the long-term finance can be got at, at as low as cost as possible. Um, the, there's site services fund money to go, go in, uh, and we're kind of looking at every way to get the rent uh, on that those cost rental housing as low as possible. Um, and then long term, the rent um, will be, there'll be very low increases in, in rents as unrelated <coughs> to the maintenance co costs. And um, there will come a time that the rents can be reduced very significantly when the funding is paid off, you know, when, when the, the borrowings are paid off, if that's after 20, 25 years. Um, how most countries manage to get the costs down, uh, even at that initial stage, is by looking at the funding over 50 year, years. Um, and, uh, and also, there's kind of secondary uh, state uh, loans, you know, favourable loans that don't have to be paid off for, for, for a period of, of time. But we do need to develop that cost rental sector, provide uh, rental uh, to a much wider co cohort of people, uh, and that's in public ownership or the ownership of not-for-profit uh, organisations like O'Coolon. Um, so that's just what i say for the moment. Jim, is there anything else you want to add on, on in the scary road? Um, Perhaps a little bit of a little bit more detail, but um, just on the land control uh, point you raised earlier, that we, we have done that in that instance, uh, and there's been a combination because there's a degree of legal complexity around how to deal with it. But um, we we put both leases and uh, covenants in in the transfer in relation to that. So um, the long term use of the, the the land there has been, I suppose, confined to both social and cost rental units. Uh, into the future, and the, the length of lease is 150, but the, the transfer uh, goes beyond that in, in terms of time. Uh, just on the the, um, the current status of it, um, just referring back to your earlier comment that it's been nearly ready for, for quite some time, tenders um, were, they came back there in the autumn of last year, late autumn of last year or so, um, and they've been assessed, uh, so a, 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 you know, a, a designated tractor, or, sorry, contractor uh, has been selected. And at the moment, I suppose, it's at a stage where we're trying to finalise the, the, the financing and the funding side of things. Um, the, the site has been successful in the service site submission. Uh, Dunley right down were successful in relation to that. Uh, and there was a meeting just yesterday in relation to uh, trying to tease out the, you know, the final uh, elements of that. Uh, and then there'll be further meetings next week in relation to try uh, and try to do the funding. But again, just reiterating what John said, there's a, a keen focus to try and use the various tools that are there um, to try and make the uh, initial rents uh, as low as, as can be while at the same time financing the cost. Okay, Connor. Thanks very much, Chair, um, and thanks to the Senator and uh, Deputy O'Brien uh, for the comments on the research. Let me uh, take the, the, the responses in reverse order. I'll, I'll first deal with the, the structural versus cyclical issue that we, we concluded in our research, and then I'm, I'll, I'll, I'll make a short comment on, you know, the income, you know, middle income earners and how to define uh, housing affordability challenges that they may face. Um, so in terms of the, the structural versus cyclical issue, what, what we're, you, uh, Deputy Brin has put it very well, what we're basically saying is that across the period we have looked at, this problem has always been there for these groups of households. And um, what we find is that uh, households in the private rental sector, approximately 30% 30 of, the, 30 of those would be classed as having high housing affordability, uh, high housing costs by international definitions. Um, but then for the low income households in that group, it's up to 70% of those households would have uh, high, high housing costs. So, you know, our, the inference from that evidence is that these households are in a tenure that's unsuitable for, to manage their, their housing costs. And that's why we conclude that 
the provision of, of, of an alternative rental model for those households, you know, provided within the context of state provision, is, is critical to, to, to dealing uh, with the affordability challenge for, for those particular uh, households. And as I said, that has persisted across the period. It's you know, very, you know, since 2014, um, there has been well documented rapid increase in private rents in Ireland, um, which are you know, due to a number of factors, the, the excess demand for housing, the, the macroeconomic uh, recovery, um, the labour market improvements. But regardless of all of these fluctuations, that has persisted over time. And I think that's a critically important uh, to issue to highlight. Um, in terms of the, uh, one of the, the, the interesting aspects of the research that, that we found is that um, we looked at not only how much they spend on their income, uh, but also is what they have left over enough to buy a normal standard living that we would expect a household to be able to make. And what we found is that households all the way up to the 40th, 50th percentile of the income distribution, so middle income households, wouldn't have had enough after they, they paid their housing costs in, in, in either the private rental or the, the mortgage sector to buy a, a standard basket of goods. So. That's why in the paper we, we were calling for uh, the, the introduction of a definition of housing affordability which would take into account not only the cost of housing in terms of the share of income that they're spending on a monthly basis, but also how much they have left uh, afterwards and, and is that sufficient. So it's a, a broad definition that would, would, would be able to, to take these nuances uh, in, into account and, and we think that's an important takeaway uh, from the work that we've done. Um, thank you, Chair. Uh, just to then respond to Senator Boyne's question about differential rent schemes. So these vary hugely across local authorities, both in terms of the minimum rent people pay, the maximum rent that they pay, whether it's capped at all or not, um, how fast any income is means tested to determine people's rent contribution, even the definition of that income. Some local authorities take into account family income, or the artist formerly known as family income supplement, now known as working families payment. Um, some don't. Uh, so there's this huge amount of variation, and the issue that I was highlighting in the opening statement is that under HAP, these schemes are going to be used to determine uh, people renting, HAP claimants who are renting the private rental market, how much they will pay in rent. Um, and so the levels of support for a national scheme is going to vary hugely for families with identical circumstances in different areas. So there's kind of a, there's an issue, maybe there's, it's a separate issue in a way to local authority differential, for, sorry, for differential rents for local authority tenants in that this is very much a national scheme and yet the level of support is varying in a way that it's hard to kind of understand the policy intent behind that. So the national differential rent scheme was the one that we'd kind of assessed. Uh, this was one proposed back in 2014, but hasn't been brought forward. There was a commitment in Rebuilding Ireland to re review the disparate national uh, differential rent, or sorry, to review the <coughs> differential rent schemes across local authorities by quarter two, 2017. That was yet to be finalised. Their latest update on the Rebuilding Ireland target was that that was going to be published at the end of last year. As far as I know, it's yet to be published. Um, so that might be something people wanted uh, to take up. Um, but fun fundamentally, the issue of you know, the subsidy that people at, at different income levels should get is a political matter, and so that's not something we can kind of input on. But what we, you know, at least for HAP, using a national differential rent scheme, a unified scheme, makes sense. Um, and you, you can do so, you can design one such that you know, people's rents, the rent that people pay, rises with their income up to a point at which they start paying the private rent, the, the, uh, the, the market rent for the property that they're renting at, whatever income level people determine is appropriate. That's an issue for, for, for I suppose, fundamentally politicians to decide. Um, and just to acknowledge then that there is, an issue, there is kind of a, se a separate issue that if you, you know, you, you could design a national differential rent scheme that's only used for HAP. There is an issue with, uh, as, as John mentioned, in terms of transitioning people over who are on existing local authority leases and paying differential rents in that it would result in some winners, some losers, and you might want to stagger that over a number of years. But it, it seems that, you know, that, that, that the problem is going to get also going to be the case for people renting under HAP in five years' time if we've got, as the government hopes, 80,000 people, say, have been moved on to HAP. It's going to get harder to introduce a national differential rent scheme for them as well. At the moment, there's not a huge number of HAP tenants, uh, but it's going to get harder and harder to do this, precisely for the reason that you get winners and losers, the more people are on that scheme. So it, hopefully that kind of gets us at your question, um, Senator. Okay. Uh, I'll now take Deputy Barry. 
So I'm just going to start with uh, a quick observation and then uh, one question for each group. So um, at the start of November, I think um, the O'Coolan Co-Housing Alliance organised a conference. And the conference was addressed by Orla Hegarty from the UCD School of Architecture. And in the course of her remarks, she said the following, uh, she said, I think we need to redefine what affordable housing is. I would have a concern that defining affordable housing as a product or a niche market or a scheme is not the way to look at this. We need to talk about affordability as the underpinning strategy for all housing policy. Now, I think that there is a lot of sense in that comment. The question is, do you define affordability according to income? or you define affordability according to cost. It strikes me with respect to the SRI that they're trying to square the circle here by saying, well, we define it on the basis of cost, but we need to take into a, uh, account whether you can afford the basket after you've paid out your rent or your mortgage. I, I, I think fundamentally you have to be based on one or the other. And I think if you have a housing policy which is geared towards meeting the needs of people rather than the profits of a minority, you have to base it on the question of uh, your income. All right, fifteen percent maybe for people on the lowest incomes, up to maybe twenty-five percent. I would argue uh, would be um, uh, uh, the best policy, uh, and that means in reality that the provision of affordable housing is first and foremost overwhelmingly the responsibility directly of the state. So. To get into the actual questions, first question is for uh, the SRI. Um, you've got some interesting stats in, in your report. It's very helpful, very useful. Um, the lowest 25% of the population in terms of income are paying, I take it from the figures, 40% of their income on rents or mortgages. Um, how does that compare with other European countries? Uh, is there any other European country where the percentage would be as high? Um, and if the average is 40%, well, that implies that there are some that are maybe a bit below that, but that there are some that are above it. Right? And something that I am increasingly coming across now particularly in relation to young workers in precarious jobs paying rent, the idea that you pay more than 50% of your income on rent. And I'm wondering if you might be in any position as to give a statistical evidence as to how prevalent that is. Second question I'm directing to the reps from the Housing Agency. Um, you mentioned the new affordable purchase scheme. Well, we're waiting, <laughs> and we're wondering if you have any more detailed or concrete information as to when we're going to see uh, the colour of the Minister's money uh, in relation uh, to that. Also, are you in a position to enlighten us as to how the Minister is going to square this particular circle? Because we were told at budget time that this would be a 40% reduction for some buyers. But 310 million has been set aside for 6,000 affordable homes. That's an average discount of slightly over, but only very slightly over, 50,000. Now, 50,000 off the market value of a home doesn't come next nor near to a 40% discount. So, even if you do a manoeuvre here or a manoeuvre there in order to try and bump it up, it's still not clear, not clear to me, as to how you're going to reach that 40% on the basis of the funding that's put, been put aside there. And if you're in a position to give us any more information in relation to that, it would be helpful. I know you may not be, but if you were, I, I'm inviting comment on that. And the final question is going to be more of a local question, uh, which is geared towards the reps from O'Coolan, because I notice in your report that you say, in the case of Boher Boy in Cork, uh, we would need to add another 13,000 per unit to cover the cost of the site and an average of 5,000 per unit 
to cover development levies. There's a lot of interest in Cork City and County about the Bohor Boys scheme. There's a lot of interest in the idea of being able to afford to buy, uh, afford to buy a house on this scheme. But there is perhaps a need for more information out there in the public about how this scheme is going to operate. Um, and I'm wondering if you can maybe go into a little bit more details about the ins and outs of that scheme. Thanks, Mick. That's it. Grace. Um, first question is to the ESRI uh, with regard to accessibility and affordability. So when you do your research, um, do you look at accessibility um, with regard to, to housing? Um, and the reason I'm asking is, uh, you know, there's, there's always the cost of, of getting to work, getting to school, getting to, so within a community, getting to facilities, and have you looked at that? Um, and uh, I have that same question to um, Hugh, uh, O'Coolong in terms of accessibility because you were talking about the IDA land which I think is a really uh, interesting suggestion um, that the state would make 20% of the, that land over to housing but again many of the IDA sites are well without uh, outside the cities so again in terms of accessibility how would you square that circle for O'Coolong and um, also, uh, with regard to Okulong, you talk about building communities and that social, you, you describe yourself as a social developer, which um, I think is a very uh, positive, very good uh, term. But how do you, beyond supplying housing, uh, how do you build communities? Uh, because with regard to the site um, in Cork and the development outside, as Okulong, would move outside of um, Dublin. Um, how do you propose to build communities um, in other areas like Cork, Waterford, Galway? Um, and uh, let's see, yeah, that's, that's pretty much it, yeah. Okay, I'll start with. Uh, thanks, Chair. Um, so let me first pick up on um, Deputy Barry's uh, comments. Um, I guess w when we were looking, um, at generally trying to define uh, how many households would, uh, meet, would have housing affordability challenges. Internationally, there is this move towards using a, a particular figure like 30% of income or a, a st you know, one specific figure. Um, and what we found when we looked at the other international models, in particular the Australian case where they use a, a, both an income limit and a housing cost uh, definition, that these are much more accurate in defining those households who, ex post, we also see have other metrics of economic strain. So, for example, would be in mortgage arrears or would be, uh, you know, find it difficult to make ends meet or other characteristics of, of distress like uh, poverty or, or so on. So, our, our point in this particular research was to say, look, um, we do need to take into account uh, the housing cost, which is used more broadly in, in general, but you do really need to take into account the income. And for, for many households, even if you lower the housing cost to income ratio to very low levels, they will have insufficient income to buy what we would account for as a normal basket of goods and services. So for these households, there needs to be a dovetailing of both housing policy and social welfare policy because it's income supports that many of these households need as opposed to direct housing interventions. So it's that, that kind of dovetailing of the two uh, policy areas that we think is particularly important and that's why we, we think you, you can't come at this problem with just a, a housing policy or separate uh, an income support policy. They need to be integrated and that's the, the point we're trying to, to make uh, in, in our research. Another point on that is that uh, one of the nuances that we found in our research is that if you set a particular target, say for example 30% of income or an income limit of say 35,000 or so, these set thresholds cause difficulties because people fall either side of those thresholds and they can have very similar challenges but just because they fall on one side of the threshold you get these discontinuities. So what we are trying to say is that you know, when you're trying to define these, these uh, housing affordability challenges, you may need a graduated model which, which allows housing cost and the income metrics to vary 
across uh, across the income scale. So it's it, it's it's a complex problem. Uh, there's a lot of moving parts with it, but we, we feel like uh, you, you need to take uh, all of these issues uh, into account. Um, in terms of the European comparison, it's actually a really good question. Uh, we haven't been able to do that uh, comparison. Uh, one point of, of the reason why we can't is that the, the Irish uh, Survey of Income and Living Conditions is the only one of its kind in Europe that asks for the housing cost as part of the survey. So uh, while those surveys are available in other European countries, that particular indicator is not. So we, we would uh, really have liked to benchmark Ireland with our European peers, but we haven't been able to uh, to, to to do that um, that particular um, benchmarking, which I, I think it would be a very useful exercise um, to do. In terms of um, what proportion of uh, the households would pay 50% plus on on, on rent. Um, in particular, I don't have the, the specific numbers on that. It is possible with the, the data that we have to, to, to look at that particular um, issue. But, you know, what we're, we're saying in the paper is that for low-income households, particularly the 25% <coughs> of the income distribution, you know, the fact that we would classify 70% of those as having high housing cost using the international metrics um, does suggest that the average masks a huge amount of of, of challenge for, for pockets of, of, and you know, if the average is two fifths, then you can be sure that there's a very large proportion that are, are well above that. So I think that the, the, there, there are certainly pockets of vulnerability uh, in, in particular. Um, in, in terms of Senator O'Sullivan's points on the accessibility, what we've done, as I mentioned in the opening statement, is purely to look at the housing cost issue. This doesn't take into account any ancillary services or other utility costs that come with running a household. So uh, we, we don't take into account the, the travel cost or the transport costs of getting to work or to getting to whatever your normal uh, place of business is in. So in a sense, it doesn't even take into account, for example, home insurance or, or any of these ancillary costs that you would need to, to, to pay to, to run a household. So, you know, in a sense, these are, are lower bounds and in terms of the estimate of how much it costs a household uh, to maintain maintain a home, and this is purely on the basis of the euros they spend on their mortgage payment or their rental payment. Okay, uh, John or Jim? Yes, yes. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair. Um, first, just Deputy Barry, in terms of an overall co co comment, you, you raised, you know, affordability should underpin, you know, the whole approach to. to, to uh, housing, whether it's for home ownership or for rental, yeah, and I agree with you. You know, it's it, sh it needs to be across the board in terms of wanting rent to be uh, reasonable rent, uh, rental accommodation, uh, and for housing to purchase that it's, it's a reasonable co cost. So, um, and and getting into too many schemes can be very dangerous. Uh, again, not highlighting what they do in other countries, but often it's just it, it's the focus is on having um, rental. You know, that is. Uh, rent accommodation that is a, as a reasonable rent and, and not even ch ch trying, to, trying to chase the market or anything like that. In terms of, uh, very importantly, when you talk about household income uh, and what, what they can afford from affordability and we want use a rough guide of one third you know, of household income, when it does go to lower incomes, uh, if someone is earning under 20,000, you're talking about 15% uh, of a person's income, that, that is a significant uh, burden. Uh, Households, you know, between 20 and 30, 25 percent is a significant burden, and you also want uh, long term, actually, for somebody's um, percentage of income to, to de decrease. So it's not a case of keeping it uh, at, a, at a high level. Uh, there's a lot more I could say on, on that, that um, but the, it, it is very much dependent uh, on income, uh, and not just short term, but all, also think uh, 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 long term. Um, in terms of the new affordable uh, purchase scheme uh, and where that is, is at. Um, the, as I understand, the Minister of the Department uh, intends to give effect, uh, full, full effect to, the, to that uh, in the next um, number of weeks. Uh, the legislation underpinning it was, was commenced last year, which is part five of the Housing Miscellaneous Provisions Act uh, 2009. So, so legislation has commenced. Uh, regulations need to be introduced, which I understand will be introduced short, shortly. Um, there's already funding going in um, 
in relation to housing. So you have the um, what's called LIHAF, the Local Infrastructure Housing Administ uh, Activation Fund. So that's already uh, starting, and uh, an amount of housing that is being provided in private developments will have to be sold or should be sold as affordable housing. So um, the, the funding is going in uh, already to deliver uh, an amount of affordable housing. What needs to get going now is uh, in relation to local authority on, on, on other sites, uh, actual delivery uh, of affordable housing for, for purchase. In terms of keeping the price down to an affordable level, it is about um, keeping uh, using land maybe at no cost. It's about putting in infrastructure f uh, funding. Um, so the focus again, rather than uh, thinking about the market price, how can we keep the cost of providing the house down uh, as low as possible uh, in, in, the, in the first case uh, and make it affordable uh, to households. So anyway, the, the scheme say, is uh, you know, due to, to uh, commence fully, uh, you know, um, I think short, shortly. Thank you. Thank you. Or John, would you? Yeah, John, I'll just talk about Boer Boy first, and then yeah. I'll talk about the accessibility things. Yeah, um, as regards the Boer Boy scheme, um, the only information we have is, is that the, the cost of the site will be two million. Levies will have to be paid, but that there is 4.2 million uh, of a grant for service, uh, services to the site. Um, we'll only find out what, how that's going to work if we are selected for stage two. At the moment, it's only the expressions of interest that have gone in. But it, you could look at it and say that uh, the service site uh, fund of 4.2 million uh, is being used to pay for the site. They're taking 2 million for the site, uh, which leaves us with about 2 million to service the site, which may not be enough to service 147 houses. And again, we won't know um, until we get selected or if we get selected for stage two. Sorry? When will you know? Oh, 15th of February. We'll know if we're going forward. You, you and then in terms of accessibility, yeah, so <coughs> if you look, look at Poppentry, um, that's probably one of the best areas in the country for a, a residential development because it's so close to everything. You know, 10 minutes from the airport, you know, um, 20 minutes on your bike into town, I've done it, or 25 minutes coming back out because it's uphill, um, close to Bowman Hospital, close to DCU, um, close to the M50, that's ideal. And that's what we look for when we're, when we're looking at other sites. We certainly don't want to be pushed out to the extremity where people have you know, transport costs, um, uh, etc. And you spoke with building community. What we do is we bring people together um, in advance before the, ha before the houses are ever constructed and um, they, they, they form their little group. Um, they have several meetings. They decide on their common charter. In Poppentry, they, you know, when, when they were preparing the common charter, they said they wanted to live in a development where they got to know their neighbours before they moved in, where they all looked out for each other, where the mortgages didn't cripple them, where, the, where their energy bills were low, um, where the houses were built to the best international standards and where they felt safe and secure. And we kind of say, well, that's not too much to ask for any community. And that's kind of our, our guideline moving on to the next development now in Cranogue, and we'll be going through the same process in Cranogue. Similarly, we, ha we hope to have one in Ardmore in Waterford of 20 units, uh, five of which will be social, um, again with Tua. And then if we get the ones in Cork, we'll, we'll, we'll adopt the same kind of thing. And then just, a, 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 just one comment, if I may, on the, on, 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 on the LIHAF. I think that we need to be a little bit more rigorous in looking at... Uh, the, the, the subsequent sale of the houses in, in uh, those kind of private developments. Like there's one in Swords, for example, and um, the uh, government and the local authority have put in something like 4.9 million in LIHAF funding, and the advert came out, and um, the, a two-bedroomed two affordable house there is going to be 295,000. Now, for me, that's not affordable, because a two-bedroomed two house, you're looking for, at somebody maybe on you know, 45, 50,000, well, it's not affordable uh, for them, and you can just look, look uh, you can check the chart. Or it said, I think, that they were going to be 2,500 less than the market value. Well, that's not affordable. So I honestly believe that, in t you know, in terms of you are putting a lot of money like that, um, to, you know, to make housing available, and I absolutely agree with it, but be a little bit more rigorous 
in dealing with the, with the developer in terms of the ultimate uh, sale price. That's all, all I would say on that. Could I just ask a supplementary to yeah, the... Go ahead, Chris. So do you have a, a definition of affordability when you're conducting your research? So, so we, we, we looked at a, a couple of models. Um, there's there's um, three main international models. One is to say, you know, is your housing cost higher than 30% of your net monthly income? Um, a second model takes into account, it says you have to be in the bottom 40% of the income distribution as well as having a high housing cost. And then a third model says, you know, take one of the first two and then see how much people have left after they, they have made their, their housing payment. Um, and what we've, uh, kind of, the conclusion we're making in our paper is that you want to get somewhere between the 30-40 the model, so for the low-income households, 30% of their income max, um, and, but allow that to, to stagger up a little bit because there are higher income households, sort of middle income households, who still uh, don't have sufficient resources uh, available after they, they make their, their, high, their housing payment. So in general, the definition that we would say is that, you know, approximately 30% of income max for household, for, in particular for the bottom 40% of the income distribution. Maybe it should even be lower, as other commenters have said, um, for lo very low income households. Um, but then allow it to come up even to, to, to middle income earners uh, to, to take those, their housing costs into account. Okay, Grace. Thanks. Uh, apologies, I had to just attend the business committee, so apologies for the delay. Richard. Yeah, thanks to everybody for all of your contributions. It's been extremely informative and helpful, I have to say. Um, <clears throat> and, and I welcome the fact that you're all, if you like, confirming in your different ways something that I think everybody out there just knows, which is that the private market is not capable of delivering uh, affordable housing for huge numbers of people. I don't know if the SRI said, and this is a question to you, uh, although you gave us a lot of useful information, <coughs> um, how, much, how, how much of our housing needs to be social or affordable, do you think? I mean, given that... Uh, unaffordability, as you said, is persistent. It's not cyclical, it's not just the outcome of a crash or whatever, it, it's a, a consistent feature. Consistently, to solve this problem, how much of the housing output needs to be social and affordable? Um, uh, in your opinion. Um, and do you think the proportion uh, needs to increase, if you know what I mean, uh, because to me, unaffordability is getting worse, right? It's persistent, but it's getting worse. And that would seem to me an international pattern. Uh, whether you go to London or New York or Paris or in fact most of Europe, <coughs> it seems to me that unaffordability is becoming more and more of a problem for more and more people. To put it like in simple terms, people on average or slightly above average earnings, I think, but this is just my sort of anecdotal uh, observation, could entertain the prospect of getting a mortgage to buy a house on the private market. But I think roll the clock on today, there's huge numbers of people on the same levels of incomes can never hope to do that. Not just now, but never ever in the future. Right? And I think that has radical policy implications, and I'd like, uh, I'd like you to comment uh, on that. And that kind of relates to another question, a sort of follow-up question. One of the mantras that absolutely infuriates me, right, uh, which we hear, and I know this may be asking you to stray into the political sphere, so if you can't, you can't. We pretend it's not politicians who say it, right, uh, is... We just need supply. And if we just get supply, everything will be okay. Now, I think that's a load of crap, right? Uh, uh, what do you think? Um, because it's very important uh, to say what we think about that. You see, I don't think that the private market, if it just ratchets up supply, at any point is going to provide affordable housing for a very significant cohort of society. Uh, it didn't when we did have massive supply in the private sector prior to 2008, 
and I don't think it is in the future. But that has very important policy implications, the answer to that question. Uh, personally, I think that at the point that the private sector m might produce a supply that could actually lead to a drop in prices, it would actually just stop supplying. That's what I think. What do you think? Um, on uh, the question of sort of then, you know, how do we deliver the social and affordable housing that we need, the big frustration for just ordinary people sitting in there is, yeah, <coughs> analysis, great, plans, great, where is it? <laughs> where is the social and affordable housing? Um, and uh, I, I'd like somebody to answer the question, what is the delay, right? What is the delay in us getting it? Uh, I'd be from a cool on, I'd be particularly interested, what, what time frame for you guys is there, and how does that compare to what's happening everywhere else? Do you know what I mean? If you get a piece of land uh, from the state, from the moment you get it to the delivery of that uh, social and affordable housing, how long does it take? We need, like, I think you can probably answer that question, for very significant sect sectors of the, st of the state, we can't get an answer to that question. You know, like in our case, locally, Shangana is the, one of the big sites. We're just pulling our hair out, right? We've been talking about it for five years, and they're now talking about 2022, I think, for delivery. And I'm just going, what is going on here that it's taking this long? So you might have thoughts on that, but maybe you can certainly answer the question, how long does it take you? Um, and this then relates, I suppose, to, to uh, my second last question, which is this, yeah, the question of affordability. Mick Barry has already talked about it. You see, to me, part of the answer to the question of why there's delay is because we're not answering that question of cost versus affordability, right? Uh, I think that's what's delaying everything. Because if we just said affordability is the issue, and we're going to deliver affordable housing and we're going to finance it because the state can afford to finance things over the long term. The private market can't. It needs to make profit in a relatively short period of time. The state can, can extend these things out. It can eventually cover the cost because it's in for the long haul. Uh, so why do, <coughs> do you think it's a fair comment to say, let's stop the messing around and just say it's affordability is the issue. Uh, we need to deliver housing that's affordable. Uh, we need to decide what is affordable. I agree with the 15 to 25, maybe up to 30 when you're getting to the higher, but certainly for the lower. But let's just say that's what we're going to do. That would simplify matters and we could just get a move on then and then we can work out the finance, you know, how, how the state finances it or assists others like yourselves to finance it uh, after that. But we could get a move on. Uh, and the last question is about... Um, you know, social mix and the social, affordable, cost rental and all this sort of stuff, right? Now, I know that some people just want to buy their houses and we should make affordable housing available for those people. Uh, where I begin to get a bit confused is uh, this social versus cost rental stuff. Now, I'm for it. Anything that helps solve the problem, I'm for it. But I also kind of get a bit <coughs> annoyed and frustrated that we're trying to work out this dilemma. Because, you know, to really bring it down to brass tacks, I'm dealing with three people at the moment who have been knocked off the housing list because they do overtime, right? Because they do overtime. And they have to do overtime to pay the rent. If they don't want to do overtime, they don't want to work Saturdays, but they're having to, and they're getting knocked off the list, which is just disgraceful, right, uh, that that's happening. Um, but, like, to me, why is there any income threshold on social housing? Do you think there should be any income uh, threshold on social housing? If there's anybody who wants to be able to rent social housing from the state, to my mind, should be able to put their name on the social housing list. And that would actually achieve social mix. Instead of saying, oh, there's one cohort of people who go social housing, that's really the bottom of the ladder, and then there's another cohort just slightly above that who will be cost rental, they're kind of up up the ladder, and then there'd be another group, you know, it, it's creating social differentiation, to my mind, instead of just saying, yeah, social housing, if you want social housing, if you want to go on a social housing list, fine, and it'll be based on income, and it's simple. Uh, and yes, beyond that, there may be a cohort of people who want to buy, but can't afford the private market, and therefore we need a, an affordable scheme uh, that is genuinely affordable, and the state is going to have to do that because the private market won't. 
<coughs> so maybe you could just comment on those. Barry, can do first, or Connor? Yeah. <coughs> so, I believe going to two or You're doing two at a time. Sorry, yes. Desi. Sorry, no, thanks very much. No, I was listening to all the presentations in my office, so just in case you were wondering. Um, no, there's a couple of things. I was at the conference myself um, the other yesterday, and um, I thought I found it very interesting. But it, it's very clear, that, like, from everyone, and, okay, there might be differences with so, some people, but by and large, that supply of social and affordable housing is the big issue. And and that the private market is not going to deliver that. And I think that's very obvious. But one thing I, I've, I found very hard to sort of take over the, over the years is that <coughs> nobody has come up and said that the state should, should be operating a company and, 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 and doing what we've done back in the 60s and the 70s where the state was running a company and was making it available to the different, to the different bodies for to build social and affordable. And there could be an element of building private from that as well. But I'm just saying, um, I, I, I cannot see us getting out of this circle unless we get into a recession when, when, when things will collapse. But at the moment, um, we're not going to uh, be able to, to get, get rid of our major problems with homelessness and housing. That's just um, a general thing that seems to be coming across at that conference, and that's the way I've read it. Um, but I, just um, in regards to the HAP, we're spending something like between 700 and 800 million now between the HAP, RAS, and, and, and rent supplement. And increasingly now, this is now, um, the local authorities are sending out letters that you have to come on to HAP from rent supplement. That's now increasing the amount of homeless people because this is actually where nobody can get HAP and they can't even get their landlords to agree to HAP. I'm finding now that's nearly come to a standstill. We've transferred as many people from rent supplement, we've, we've done all that. Now we're going into a situation where that's virtually coming to a standstill. So I think we're really facing a very serious situation and I think we need to be watching that. Uh, and and um, it's, 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 it's just, I've had several people in, in the last few weeks in my office for the same reason. So I just think we want to watch what's going on there. And I'd like to hear, you know, the amount of money. And we're, we're told by 2020 it's going to be over a billion or thereabouts. I mean, that's absolutely scandalous that this money has been put in the way it is and we are investing it in social and affordable. And it was also interesting to see, I've always had this thing, I come from Finglas, I was born in Finglas, I came from a, 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 a council estate, and I've always been upset by this general opinion that we have to have social, affordable and private, and we don't have that, there's something wrong. There was always this constant remarks about social housing as though people who are looking for social housing came from a different background than everyone else. I've always been very, very upset by it, and I'd never bought it, and I never <coughs> will. And even listening to the conference and some of the speakers, it's quite clear that we were very successful in building social housing. And we have models that are going back for many years. And, and, and I, you know, what's wrong with us looking back at those models and utilizing them? You know, I, 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 just, I just don't get um, this constant, you know, our biggest problem in building the, many of the estates, whether it's Fingers, Ballymoon, Tallinn, places like that, was not putting the infrastructure, not putting the, you know, all the different facilities, <coughs> the creches, the shopping malls, the transport, all these came after in, in most cases. But many of them are in place now. So, and I did get the impression from Brendan Kenny, and I'm a very, uh, I'm a very great admirer of Brendan Kenny. But one thing I disagree with him on, that he's adamant that we won't be putting large scale uh, developments in place where there's going to be a lot of uh, social housing. Now, we haven't got many left in Dublin City Council, but Fingal has. Fingal has very huge, large tracts of land that we could build a massive amount of social and affordable housing. Probably the biggest amount in the country is in Fingal, you know? So it's just a thing that I, 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 it upsets me. Um, Hugh, I'm a great admirer of Akula on housing, um, but 
the one thing that's coming across that I think there's a doubt in the minds of Dublin City Council that you can deliver large scale. I'll be honest, um, I've had this argument with them and you're confined now to, there's a 30 or so, 38 units coming up now in, in Ballymore and the, the quality of the house you've delivered is outstanding, really good and um, you're the only affordable thing in town at the moment and it's really baffling. But you did say there's something that surprised me. Um, you felt you were being confined to Ballymon. I thought I got that impression from what you said. Um, now, I would be very disappointed to think that that would be the case. I know you're moving into Cork and you're moving somewhere else. But in Dublin City Council, you gave me that impression when you were talking. Um, I think that's not... Um, so there's plenty of places right across Dublin that could, could utilise. But is it down to the shortage of workers, skilled people, you know, are we, are we stuck in a situation where I keep hearing this that we, we need to entice people back from Australia and other places because of the shortage of workers. We lost so many of them over the last number of years. But is, it, is that one of the biggest stumbling blocks that we have in terms of ourselves? Because it, that's, that's really what's, what, what's coming across to me. Recently, Dublin City Council spent 35 million in buying 90 units. Work out that. Now, just work it out. The four bedrooms, between one, two, three, and four, the four bedrooms alone cost 500,000 each. Now, the builder must be, you know, he is, he's sitting there laughing and saying, my God, what in, what's going on in the world? Surely we can build houses, you can build them at less than half that price, and surely we can do better than that. That's not value for money. I know we're in a crisis, and uh, I know the argument that's been put to me on this, but I have to say, it's just, it's mind-boggling that we are spending, we've spent so much money like that, you know? So anyhow, that's just some questions and observations I've had. Right. Um, I, so my, my area kind of research is tax welfare and pension systems, so I'm going to leave the easy questions that Deputy Boy Barrett asked to uh, my colleague Connor. Um, but one, one of the things you mentioned is the income thresholds for uh, qualifying for social housing. So they're fixed and they're, they're set just at cliff edge, so if you pass it over, you're no longer qualified. And that's a perverse um, effect of cliff edges that exist, and there's lots of them that do exist in the tax and welfare system. Um, and actually HAP, in a way, was trying to get away from that relative to rent supplement in that it was getting rid of the threshold that you face, the cliff edge, at 30 hours a week, which meant that if you work more than 30 hours, you're no longer eligible for rent supplement. And so HAP's got rid of that. It's kind of recognised that, that these cliff edges are, have disincentive effects, but not, but not for applying, yeah. So not for applying in the first instance. And there's also an inconsistency, perhaps, in the way that you can receive. So <coughs> once you qualify for social housing, once you get onto that list and find a place on HAP, your income can increase beyond those thresholds, and, but you have to be below it in the first place. So there's maybe an inconsistency there that people want to look at, but given that there, there is going to be a cost implication, which feeds into to, to other deputies' um, points about, you know, those, those thresholds reduce eligibility and so therefore keep the cost down. And then that's an issue, I suppose, for policymakers of whether the need to, in the short run at least, subsidise people's rents warrants getting rid of those kind of kind of cliff edges. Um, so there's a fundamental, I suppose, trade-off there between you might want, if you want to get rid of these cliff edges for the good reasons that you outline, there's going to be a cost implication, at least in the short run, while other policies are coming into play. Um, but I suppose, you know, I'll, I'll leave Connor then to answer those, those other questions of yours. Okay, well, uh, uh, thanks, Barr, for the difficult questions. Um, let me kind of make some general reflections on, on Deputy Barrett's uh, comments. Um, so the research we, we did did not look at what share of, say, annual output should be in particular, particular groups. Um, and uh, what we did do is we said, given the data there, what share of households would you classify as having uh, high housing costs? And across the definitions, it's between 20 and 30% of, of households. Now, that isn't the same as saying, well, we need 20 or 30% of annual output to be that, because you may need it higher if there's deficits or otherwise. But um, certainly in the long term, that's the magnitude of the share of households that you would need to be covering by these, um, in, in these proportions to be dealing with 
the, the affordability issues. Um, on the issue of, of, of uh, the mantra of just supply, we, we just need uh, more supply, um, obviously uh, it's very clear from, from, from all the, the research that there's excess demand for housing in, in, in Ireland. And we, Housing supply has been under what we would have expected by just the fundamental de demographic uh, household formation for, for a long number of years. But I, 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 it is correct to say if, if a lot of new supply comes in at prices that are unaffordable for households to purchase, then that won't alleviate the pressures on those households that, uh, so, that, that face these challenges. So it, it does matter where across the housing price distribution these new units do come online. So that is certainly uh, important. Yeah, but that, that's uh, <laughs> the way I would sum up the findings of the, of, of, of the, the, the research. Um, in terms of the, uh, the, the, the longer term, you know, one of the findings of our research is that we, we, we were pointing towards the requirement for a longer term commitment in, in, from public housing to provide a large share of of, of, um, of, of units more generally, and that would be not just when the times are good, but that would happen during times of bad. So you'd be able to smooth the economic cycle through the state provision of, 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 of housing. And I guess one of the things when you look at, at, at the use of, of subsidies like HAP, um, and, and that you know, counts for a very high share of social housing output when you look at the, 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 the current numbers, you know, it would be certainly our assessment that delivery mechanisms through build, hold and acquisition are a, another long term way to, de to, to deliver those units and redressing the balance in the long term towards those type of aspects as well as trying to develop alternative rental models like uh, cost rental you know can all be part of the solution about moving the rental model towards one which provides affordable housing more broadly for, uh, for households um, and is sustainable in, in the long term and that's particularly important. You know, one of the, the things we, we noticed um, quite clearly from our research is that when you look at low income households in the mortgage market, they were the ones who saw a really big increase in their cost of their, their mortgage relative to income during the crisis. These households took on very large mortgages that were unaffordable in the boom phase with poor underwriting conditions. Um, and they all were you know, hit with very large income shocks during the, the crisis. You know, one of the inferences from that is, first of all, you need a very strong macroprudential framework to ensure these households get the correct credit terms uh, at origination, and that's a critical uh, component of, the, um, of the, the rules. The consequence is these, these households you know, if they don't get a private mortgage, need to be housed somewhere else. And that's where the alternative rental models, we think, fit into the, to, to the scheme to protect these households from the, the, the fluctuations in the market, which are not sustainable for their circumstances. Thanks, Connor. Um, Hugh, do you want to come next? Yes, thanks. Um, first of all, just on Richard's point um, about the percentages, I will stick my colours to the mass, they say, on this, because we've looked at it. You can say... As close as it makes no difference, the 30% are either um, social tenants, HAP, RAS, in um, um, AHB housing or whatever, around 30%. The next 40% are in that cohort that are earning uh, around from 42,000 up to 79,000. We got that from Nevin and from CSO and on the, the house income. And that was in 2016. And we, we, we expect that that's grown. And we also suspect that the band has grown, that people up are at 80 and 85, especially in your constituency, certainly can't afford to, um, to, uh, to, to rent or buy. And we also know that only 7% of house sales in 2015 went to that cohort. So 93% went to above that. Um, in terms of the time frame, I can give you the exact time frame for, for, for Ballymun. We were notified that we had the site in November 2015. We started building in October 2016 and we're just finished building now. It was traditional brick and block. It was only 49 houses. Construction was slower than we, than we would like, but that was because of finance and phasing and all of that, and we were, were, we were brand new. In the next scheme, we're probably going to go for um, rapid build. Um, the time lag for, um, from getting the site to, to Section 183, planning, <coughs> conveyance, all of that takes about a year, and our, and our next build 
we hope will be down to 12 months, I think, for, for, uh, for 30 of the, of, of the houses and a little bit longer than for the, um, for, 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 for the others. Um, I actually agree with you about, you know, when you talk about income, income thresholds, and this ties into Desi's point as well. Like, um, we, get, we get this argument all the time. We will always argue for integrated housing. I don't believe that people should be segregated on the basis of, 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 of income. And people say, yeah, well, you're putting down people in social housing. No, we're not. We're arguing for that broader group that you talk about. Like, why can't we, we, you know, we all be, be, be housed together? As I said, because we are all effectively social creatures who need to live in houses, and you can spread that out. I honestly don't think, Richard, we're ever going to see it, unless they make me the Minister for Housing, and that's very unlikely. Um, but but that's, uh, that's, that's where that is. In terms the of... There the houses, you have the social housing beside you. Yeah, and them, exactly. Yeah, and, you and, they all, and they all get on well. And, and when the yeah. minister came out, he was going to stay for 15 minutes, and he ended up staying for two hours. Yeah. And all the kids were playing around him, and it was a lovely, it was a lovely day, you know. In, in uh, your point about the, the, the capacity, we're getting that. We're getting that all the time, people saying that, you know, you don't have the capacity. Now we do have the capacity. We're getting philanthropic funding, and that's why I put it into the report. We're getting a lot of philanthropic funding now to build up our capacity to make sure that we can scale and we can scale. And our capacity at the moment, if we had the land, and I said this at a previous conference, we could start this year building 940 houses. And that's us, a small little co-op. Think of what the rest of the AHB sector can do if we, put our, if we get our act together. We've argued in the past as well that not one square inch of public land should be sold to a private developer for at least the next 10 years until I don't care about it anymore. Um, and in the meantime, it can actually go to this social development side, if you like. And, and I believe that we have the capacity uh, to deliver. I don't think it's going to happen because they say that they have to sell to the private sector in order to get the money back to buy more land. Nonsense. Take a broader view on how, the value that you're getting from your land. That what we said about you know, every house that sold 50,000 going to the exchequer. And think of the benefit to the local areas of all of that extra money. It is capitalism, but we joke to say, we've said this a few times, and Owen has heard it a few times, with our model, even capitalism works. Well, I was just going to agree with uh, Richard, uh, a comment about the private sector and, and supply. And, and I was in the private building sector for a long number of years. And uh, the private sector will never uh, sort out the supply because, as you say, if there's no money to be made in it, they will stop. And that's how it always been. I've, I've yet to see a builder, and I've been with them, and uh, I've been with some of the biggest ones, to sell a house yet at a loss. And the only time, and I, I, and I see them setting out prices for houses, and the first thing they'll do, or look, go look at a bit of land, the first thing they'll do is they'll ask, what will I get for this house here? They don't look at the value of the land or their costs. They look at what am I going to get at the end, and then they work back from it. And that's what they, they, they put a value on the land in and say, I can't sell for less than 400 or 300, whatever it is. So I agree fully with you on that one. Thanks, John. John? Thank you, uh, Chair. Chair. Um, start, sorry, with Deputy uh, Boyd Barrett, you start with the first question you asked in terms of what percentage of housing should be public, ha public ha housing. Um, at the moment, it might be of the order of 10%. Um, we definitely need to be moving towards 25%, possibly up, up to 40% public, public housing. In, if you take the Netherlands, Denmark, Austria, which you mentioned, that we have reasonably successful housing systems, they, that public housing, you know, or non-profit housing, would account for 50%, you know, of the order of 50% of their overall housing. You know, so we do need to be uh, moving up to a higher percentage than we are, we are at the moment. There's, there's no question of that, and that needs maybe to be one objective in terms of our um, objections into the future. In terms of housing, so you said, is supply the issue? Yes, we definitely need more housing supplied, but it's a question of what type of housing and, and for who, you know, so it's, 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 it's um, not, you know, again, not to over rely on a private market to supply that. It, it needs uh, the private market, but also supplying, um, again, rental housing for a wide, wide cohort of people that, that that's, that's affor affordable. Um, in terms of getting the supply going, probably the, the, the issue that we have to address is building on, sc on scale. You know, so in terms of on the public housing side, 
we're trying to deliver you know, small development, small, small sites. That won't give us the, uh, deli the, deli the delivery we need. Uh, so we need to uh, deliver on uh, a much bigger scale on those uh, public, publicly controlled uh, sites um, and maybe not get too hung up uh, on saying, you know, we have to have houses for sale, we have to have this, we have to have that. We need to provide um, effectively a lot of rental housing on, on um, those sites. Uh, one thing I just ask, you know, the committee, you know, to consider um, is, is the balance between home ownership uh, and rental housing. Um, th there, there needs to be both. There needs to be home ownership and there needs to be rental housing. And often policies, you know, um, and initiatives are in focus on home ownership. Um, and if we don't get the balance right in terms of there needs to be rental housing uh, and we need to provide uh, rental housing that's um, one, affordable, and, and two, it's, it's, you have security of tenure uh, long, long term. So that's one thing I think that's uh, critical. Uh, the other thing about um, rental housing, and we've seen it in the private sector, um, that you can fund, you can get pension funds or investors to fund rental uh, accommodation because they know um, the whole de a whole development can be uh, funded and the whole development can be uh, delivered. When you get into housing for sale, you're, you're waiting for somebody, is somebody going to buy it? Uh, so the same can be applied to the, the state-owned land, or local authority-owned land. Let's build uh, you know, rental housing across a wide cohort you know, of households uh, at, at scale. Um, and on that issue of uh, thresholds uh, in terms of, of, of income, yeah, we, over time we do need to address that, you know, in terms of it should be, uh, anyone should be able to, you know, avail of, of pub, public housing. And again, in, in those other countries, I'm not saying we can't just replicate, we have to see how they do it and uh, see how can we apply it here. But yeah, in, we're probably the only country that has got income thresholds on eligibility for social housing. Um, so it's something that needs to be looked at, but it needs, there's a lot of changes that need to be, you know, various changes need to be done to affect that, you know. Um, the, um, on um, who delivers kind of the, you know, and Dep Deputy Ellis in terms of whether there is local authority companies, you know, so in terms of how it's delivered elsewhere, it's local authority companies, they call them municipal uh, companies in, in other countries because you know, they are municipal authorities, um, and again, the not-for-profit not sector, the housing associations. So it's, it tends to be a combination of the two, you know, in some countries favour one uh, versus the other. You know, so Sweden might have a lot of municipal housing companies delivering uh, that, uh, whereas the likes of the Netherlands has a lot of housing associations. Um, on HAP, um, uh, and the balance has to be got right, you know, HAP, has its place in terms of um, meeting uh, housing needs, but we need to get the balance right. We still need to be delivering uh, enough owned, you know, uh, social housing or public uh, housing in, in the state. Um, just to list some of the advantages of HAP, it meets people's immediate need. If somebody's on the housing list and they need to get rental accommodation uh, and they're eligible for social housing, they can now uh, avail of HAP. I take your point, you know, it's very hard in certain areas to find rental accommodation. It does encourage people to uh, take up employment, you know, and there isn't the restrictions that's been mentioned uh, as in, in rent supplements in taking up full-time employment. One uh, very important thing, actually, about HAP actually has an advantage uh, even over uh, traditional social housing. You can now move, you know, that, that if you get a job, you know, uh, in, in a different area, different county, you can move and, and stay, on, stay on HAP, you know, so that uh, gives... Uh, one, one advantage of HAP over, over other things is that, is that ability to, to, to move. Um, and for certain households, you know, so you can go, if you're in Dublin and you get a job in Mead, you can move to Mead and, and get a, a HAP property in, in Mead. So, th so there is, uh, uh, it's only been really teased out in the last um, year to, to, to make that uh, more effective. Uh, and it does allow for some households are being, you know, maybe not being allocated social housing to avail of, uh, avail of uh, house, rental housing. So there are advantages. Uh, it, it, there is a balance. We do need 
more um, publicly owned, or you know, be it local authorities or the housing associations uh, providing and owning more social housing or rental, rental housing, there's no, no question about that. So it's trying to get the balance right. Um, on the del delivery, uh, there are constraints, you know, there's the, the whole funding constraints, you know, so we talk about we have capital funding, we have current expenditure funding, and then uh, within the European Union, we are control, you know, there is controls in relation to balance sheet, you know, in terms of tre treatment. Um, so we do have to, how do we fund and deliver housing within those uh, constraints of the, the capital available, uh, current expenditure available, but also then the kind of the, the balance treat, uh, uh, treatment of, of that. It, it can be done, uh, and in some cases we might need to change uh, how we use the funding, you know, because sometimes we just continue on with, with our old uh, ways of, of doing it. Um, uh, and I say the, the, there is a, a availability of lot, of, you know, of low cost, you know, finance, you know, particularly uh, with, with, with the state and uh, long term proposals. Um, and maybe just to, to finish then with, uh, with Deputy Ellis's point, yeah, there, there's large tracts of land, yeah, and, and the state, you know, or local authorities need to, to, to develop the ones that are in their control um, and, and do it on scale. For to, to meet the housing needs. Thanks, John. Members, we're well over time, so with permission, are we okay to go to 20 past 12? Is it okay to go to that? So the last two are Pat and Owen. Pat. Yeah, and thanks, and thanks for the presentations today, and I think we could spend another day in here just discussing this, this alone. And I suppose in my own mind, when you, know, you first mentioned affordability, the automatic thing that comes into your mind is affordable to buy a home. But we equally have to remember that affordable housing is equally the rental market and, and that whole sector, which sometimes we do have a tendency to forget about. Um, and I, I do believe in a certain sort of sympathy from my own point of view here is that the cliff edge thing of qualifying for housing supports is not actually the right way to go about tackling this crisis in a long-term basis. And even describing social housing, we, I think we should have housing supports on a sliding scale. You know, and, and they're available to everyone because affordability could be different to me today than what it is in five years' time, and what my circumstances at all are in, in, in those cases depends on what my affordability is. And I think it, it, it is an area that we probably need to <coughs> dig deeper into and be a little more radical in how we how we approach this. But just maybe concentrating on a few more practical factors in relation to affordability. Um, Items that are preventing affordability, like, I mean, we can build, we can build three bed, four bedroom houses for 200,000, but we're selling them for 540. Do you know what I mean? Uh, is it down to profit? Is it down to greed? Is it down to land? What factor is land costs in all of this in relation to affordability? Development contribution schemes and levies have been mentioned here, and I often wonder, is it time to review development contribution schemes? Because we have the lie half scheme in place now, which is, in one way is providing that critical infrastructure that development levies were supposed to provide as local authority, and is there an offset happening from one and the, or the other, or should central government be left to look after critical infrastructure? The water infrastructure has now been removed from local authorities anyway, so it doesn't form part of their levy scheme anymore. And uh, just maybe if, if you have some information on that. Desi mentioned the labour, that's a huge, I suppose, issue at the moment and is adding to the cost of affordability down the line. And, and finally, Hugh, I'll come to you because there's a few interesting things you mentioned there. And one was that, uh, and I welcome your model and it's fantastic, I wish you luck with the IDA site in Greystones, by the way, <laughs> on that one. Uh, but, you know, you've mentioned it and we've all heard of it here, that, you know, these foreign direct investment companies that are coming in are now beginning to buy up properties. And some of them are buying up properties on, on a large scale, potentially, down the road. And what are the consequences of that in the long term? Do we have a full understanding of it? But as a model, we don't have to look too far back in our own history where companies provided accommodation for their employees. Even in my own small village at Glendalough, the mining company of Ireland built 20 houses in Glendalough for their employers. 
We had the Kynox factory in Arthur, which built the weapons for the wars. It built nearly 150 houses in Arthur. They are now all listed houses, perfectly usable today. So th this thing about employees getting involved, or companies getting involved in the delivery of housing has happened in our past. <coughs> And should we be actually looking at these companies that are coming in and asking them, can they contribute to the housing crisis in a more official way than what they are at the moment? Because it probably could help in some way in creating affordability for their employees, if nothing else. And that's what it was about many years ago, was providing an affordable place for their employees to work. And on your own model, and you know, you talk about your scale and, and What's, to what scale do you want to get to, Hugh, or you know, what could you take on tomorrow? If everything was in place for you today, what is the scale you're talking about delivering? There are just a few points there. Thanks. Just, just a very brief follow-up point, and it's, it's just to draw out, um, I, I think, one of the, the main implications of what both John and, and uh, the two lads from the SRI are saying. Mara and Comer. Yes. <laughs> I, too much Netflix last night. Um, so if we're saying, and, and I completely agree with both of you, that we need to be moving to a public housing stock of somewhere in the region of 20 to 30 percent to meet that structural demand within social and affordable housing need. And at the same time, if the state has a commitment under the National Development Plan to deliver about 25 to 30,000 new units to the overall housing stock annually then we're looking at a far greater portion of those being non-market housing, being public housing, than is envisaged under either Rebuilding Ireland or the general targets that are in the NDP, you know, post-2021. So either A, the question is, and John, maybe you're more, more able to answer this than, than uh, uh, the lads, is what percentage of that 25 to 30 thousand units should be public because you know by some rough calculation you're probably looking at something like 50 percent of it like at least 14,000 units or 15,000 units annually being in the public housing system to try and absorb that need over you know even over a decade long period of time but also is is there a need for the housing agency the SRI NESC or whoever to sit down and actually try and really you know meth in a, in a way that's really kind of uh, empirically uh, uh, robust, try and actually work out of the new people coming into, the new households coming into our system every year, what percentage of those households are falling into the categories that we're talking about here? Because it's all very well saying 30% of, of existing renters, but that doesn't tell us about the percentage coming into the rental market. Because uh, I just think that maybe that's one of the most important things that could come out of this discussion is, how many of these units do we actually need over a decade and therefore what percentage of the NDP because really what both of you are saying I don't want to put words into your mouth and, and the chair will stop me if, if she thinks I'm doing such a thing but what both of you are saying this is a question is that the rebuilding Ireland and NDP targets don't come close to meeting the level of need that your research and John your experience says that's actually out there so I'd be interested in your responses to that you will come to you first chair, chair there was just a, one question that I didn't get an answer can I just just to ask it again. If you have 10 seconds. Yep. The, the delay <coughs> in the delivery of an affordable scheme and affordable housing, is it to do with this cost affordability uh, dilemma, right? And, and therefore we should just fix on affordability to, to solve that problem. But is that, is that the reason for the delay in an affordable scheme? Um, Thanks, Richard. Will you just tell us about Mullen and Still? Why do they still nearly say no? Well, on the still road. Yeah. Why do they say no? Will you answer that as well? Okay, sorry. So, Pat, first of all, um, the factors. So, yes, land, obviously. Um, development levies, yes, play a part. Um, cost of construction, we, we take that as set. We, that's not something that we can um, uh, in, interfere with. And it's not, it's not a huge uh, factor in there. It's not. Um, and and the, the labour issue not hugely because now we can go to volumetric construction or we can go to rapid build um, uh, construction but what we're finding is we're finding the bigger contractors are coming to us anyway and we ask them what their capacity is and they say yes they have the capacity 
to, to, to work with us and, 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 to, and to build. So I'm not sure that the labour issue is as huge as, uh, as, as, as we think it is. The big one, though, Pat, is developers' margin. You see, we never know, really know what that is, as, as, as John um, hi highlighted there. Whereas if you do it from the cost perspective, if you look at what you're getting your land for, what, you know, uh, what, the, what the subsidy is, if you like, and then what the construction cost is, then you can keep your cost down. And you spoke about that variable subsidy. That's what we talk about as well. If you're earning 42,000, you will need a full subsidy to buy one of our houses. That means you need to get the land at 1,000 euros. You need your development levies waived. You need to be working with a, a not-for-profit um, organization. But if you're earning 80,000, you still can't rent or buy, but you don't need a, a greater subsidy. And that's why that, I like that kind of variable subsidy idea. And that can also be used for affordable rental for example, you can have two people because you know we do it with social rental, but you can have two people in private rental living side by side, one just getting a, a slightly different subsidy than the other. So at the end of the day, they're paying diff um, uh, diff diff different rates. Um, the consequences of the, um, the the companies. There are a lot of companies. Another one now at in Grange Castle approached us recently. They're expanding hugely. They're going to have 1,500 employees, and they don't know how where their employees are going to live. And they're asking us, what can they do? Um, to help the situation. And what we're saying is, set up a local employees housing co-op. This is what we're saying in Bray as well. And then see if there is, and then work out what inputs the, uh, the company can put into that. What they're looking at in Bray is actually helping people who are really struggling with deposits as well, and to help them on a, on a rent to buy uh, model. And we're happy to run a, a, um, a rent to buy um, model as well. But you're right about previous co-ops. Like, we did have a good co-op um, structure in Ireland years ago, and, and Borden Mona was another example, and you gave some examples yourselves. Um, and there's no reason why that can't be repeated, because it is done around Europe. Like, we know it's done in, in, in Vienna, I know myself it's done in, 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 in Sweden, and it's done in, in, in Denmark, and there are models out there. We're not reinventing the wheel, we don't, we don't actually have to. Um, and then, sorry, in terms of, yeah, the, the delay. So, um, Honestly, I, I don't know where the delay is in, in, that, in that one in Shangana. Um, like we're told that there are infrastructure problems there as well in terms of, 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 of drainage. All I know is that if the land is if, if agreed to be uh, passed over to us and if there is um, infrastructural issues that have to, be, have to be ironed out, you will iron them out. And it depends on the number of, of, of houses that you're going to put in there as to whether it's, you know, it makes financial sense to bring, say, a sewer from, you know, 200 yards or, 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 or a, half a, mile, a half a mile away. But I do know that if we get, get a site, it seems to be taking about a year to go through all of the, uh, the paperwork, and then we can start building. And we can start building quickly now. And as, as I will keep saying, we, um, we have the, the capacity for that. And Owen, I don't know if I need to address any. No, sorry, what was it? Yeah. Yeah. Mullen Estale. Oh, Mullen Estale, yeah. So Mullen Estale, what, basically what they said was, well, first of all, that. Um, that the, the protocol is there and they would prefer to use the protocol. So they will decide um, if they want to release a house for affordable or social housing or, or whatever, and then they will put it out to a number of local authorities, and that's fine. But we noticed that the site was there, that it is zoned, and that the services are going to within 200 metres, as I said, of it. Um, and that's the answer, really, you know, that they, that they will come back to us. They, they, uh, again, they've said that they like the model, that, but... They, they kind of see us as a, a niche operator, and you know, if there's a few small houses here or there, as he said, you know, that's probably what, what we would get. But again, they, they, they speak about land value, and Mullinusdale is up there near Rathmichael, and it is valuable land. But I will continue to argue that we have to stop, as a state or as a local authority, looking at land as a commodity. We have to look on it as a resource. If we look at it as a commodity, we're always looking for the best price. If we're looking at it as a resource, we say, how can it best be used, whether it's for housing or hospitals or schools or public parks or whatever you want? John O'Connor, do you want to say uh, Yes, thank you, uh, Chair. Yeah, first, in terms of the introduction of, uh, you know, for <coughs> purchase arrangement or cost rent rental, it's, you know, the time is, is to just put the funding in place to make sure in terms of affordable housing is being delivered that it is affordable, you know, so, so how, how is, 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 is that done? So in terms of, it's, it's getting that, that right, right. Um, and as I said, an amount of funding is going in through uh, the lie half at the, at the moment, but it's, it's about how is it, fu how is it funded? How is lo what land is available from local areas of public sector so that if affordable housing is delivered, 
uh, that it's affordable. But I say it will be, you know, I expect in place within a few weeks. Um, on D D Deputy Casey, yeah, that thing is raises our ownership and rental. You just need, you know, you have to consider, uh, and that both need to be uh, looked at, as so it's not one or over the other. Uh, on the employment thing, um, yeah, in terms of get companies getting more involved in delivery of housing, I think would be uh, useful, and, and a, n a number of companies uh, are interested. You know, if if there was ways that they can partake in terms of, of, of the funding of housing. You know, there's a lot of, of, of companies that, that are interested in, in it. Maybe we have to find a way um, to, you know, you know stru structure that and make them a, a, a available, uh, make funding available from, from them. Just actually one small thing, just in terms of just a, a, a factor. If you build an office block um, and the, and you can pick any office blocks that have been built around uh, here, um, the, each person takes up 10 square metres in an office block. That's how you, how you design them. When it comes to housing, you need 40 square metres uh, per person. So for every office block, you need four uh, apartment blocks to house the people in, in that uh, office block. So that's kind of just the scale when, when we look at uh, providing employment. Just appreciate the scale of housing we need uh, to, to, to pro provide. Uh, coming to, to Deputy Rin's point, yes, we need to build it, build it up. Uh, very significant in terms of the um, amount of public housing, you know, combination of social housing, cost rental, and, and I agree, you know, long term those two should be uh, combined together. I think there is a recognition of that need, you know, for um, uh, more rental accommodation that is, is, is affordable, uh, and I think that there's a, an understanding of that and, and a commitment, you know, from the political system. Uh, to do that. In terms of the national planning framework, it's a, it's a long-term plan uh, with overall all targets. It's a um, big focus on, on, from a housing point of view, is on compact growth, growth and that's critical, you know, that, and it's something that we really need to focus on. Uh, are we getting adequate concentration of housing, adequate density of populations to make things uh, work? Um, and I think with the realisation that the need, you know, particularly in the rental sector, to provide more um, rental accommodation, you know, the, the percentage of what is being delivered, uh, we need to uh, deliver uh, more uh, you know, of that uh, lower cost rental accommodation and state con controlled. So I think that the main focus has to be on when the state has control of lands, how that is used. You know, that, that if somebody else is building the private housing, let somebody else build the private housing and let the state you know, use a bigger percentage of their of their land to uh, meet that other 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 need. Um, yeah, that's that's. Great. Thanks, John. Connor. Hey, uh, thanks, Chair. So uh, I think I'd like to echo many of the points that John made there. Again, like I, while our particular research that we we're talking about today didn't look at output per se and and, and the composition of the output between the various uh, different components. Um, you know, you know, it is clear to that that over time a heightened share of that will have to be in, in affordable and social, be whatever uh, dimension that is uh, that that constitutes. And and I think that um, over time, building up to that higher share will will have to take place. And and, and uh, in terms of the the, the new output, um, and we we haven't done any specific work on you know looking at what share of new households that are formed every year uh, will fall into the categories. Um, although we, we, we're all, always building up our, our research infrastructure and hopefully with some of the, the new models that we're hoping to, to, to put in place over the next uh, year or so, we'll, we'll be able to look at trans demographic transitions in, 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 and, and, and housing tenure. And that's something we're, we're, we're hoping to look at in, in a medium term, uh, medium term basis. Thanks, Barra. Yeah, and just very briefly to come in on Deputy Casey's point about if we were to look at moving away from income limits on, on social housing qualifications and just thinking about that in terms of HAP and what that would do, that would move us a lot closer towards the model of housing benefits, say, in the UK, where you don't have that initial income limit to qualify for it. And it goes a lot further up the income distribution that people can still be claiming something. And that, that has consequences, like a lot more houses, households are going to be eligible, it's going to cost more, and you're obviously going to want to consider how that, you know, how 
spread going from covering around a quarter of the private rental market in 2016 to beyond that is going to affect rents in general. But maybe that's the, the type of thing that need, might need to be looked at in the short term, at least, if there are these issues of housing affordability. But if you, if you do do that, what you also have to make sure you don't forget about is addressing the caps on rent limits. So the rent limits, as I mentioned in the opening statement, haven't been adjusted since March 2017, since when rents have grown nationally by about 13%. So there's, you know, that's one of the reasons, come back to Deputy Ellis's earlier point, there's fewer households being able to find house, houses available under HAP, even with the flexibility that's built in. 20% of a fixed number is that's, you know, still fixed. Um, and so that needs, to, that needs to maybe be reviewed more regularly, annually, um, like social welfare payments are. But then you also come back to the needing to address differential rent schemes. If you are going to have more and more households on, for, for at least HAP, if you're going to have more and more households on the scheme, at the moment, even if a household moves on to HAP and their income increases to 60,000, 70,000, they're not going to end up paying the market rent in the vast majority of local authority households, which means that maybe you're not directing the subsidy in the, most, in the way that you intend to do so. So by reviewing, again, this, not, these differential rent schemes for at least half, you can put in place a system where you do it closer to that housing benefit model where more people are eligible, but the subsidy declines with income up to a point at which they start paying the market rent. But again, that doesn't seem to be in the cards at the moment. Thank you, Barra. And can I thank all our witnesses for attending this morning um, this is the start of uh, us reporting on this topic so it's fascinating we might even get you back in again but thank you very much for your attendance and I can thank the members as well um, so this meeting is now adjourned next meeting at the joint committee will be held Wednesday the 6th of February at 9.30